Commissioner Wiseman? Here. Chairperson Welch? Here. Next item, please. Item 1B is flag salute. Chairperson Welch? Uh, everyone, please rise for the pledge. Thank you very much. Next item, please. Item 2 is posting of agenda. The agenda for the Monday, August 23rd, 2010, regular meeting of the Glendale Transportation and Parking Commission was posted by Friday, August 20, 2010, before 5.30 p.m. on the bulletin board outside of City Hall. Okay, thank you very much. Next item. Item 3 is approval of minutes. Item 3 is June 28, 2010, meeting approval of minutes. Does uh, anybody have any corrections or comments to make on the minutes? No. 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 Could somebody please move that we accept the minutes? Move to approve. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you very much. The minutes are accepted. Next item, please. Item 4 is oral communication. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The Commission may question the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. Uh, I have no speaker cards for oral communication, so we'll close the public hearing then and move on to uh, the next item. Item 5, report only. At item 5A, 5A is report regarding proposed fare increases for Glendale B-Line and dialerized service, services and service reductions for Glendale B-Line fixed route service. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Bagdania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Transportation Parking Commission. Uh, as you uh, remember, in fiscal year 2009, we did a line-by-line -line analysis where we look at the B-Line productivity, we analyze it to see how, what the ridership is, which lines are more productive than others. We look at the whole day of survey that was done through a consultant for us. And based on that, uh, we looked at the, what efficiencies we can achieve through the line by line ana analysis. Where do we have service levels that, let's say, the morning uh, ridership is low or the afternoon ridership is low? Can we remove some of those and take those resources and put them on areas where we really have a problem in terms of uh, uh, overcrowding on our buses? Along with that, we also looked at our uh, revenue that we receive from the um, through the Prop A and C funds that basically funds our entire uh, transit services including the diorite, the fixed route and the diorite services. Uh, and based on our uh, latest analysis that we did since the, we presented to the Commission we received some input. Uh, we looked at the operating revenue versus operating expenses and if I can see that slide uh, for the presentation purposes. Um, if you can Look at the operating revenue up to operating services. Since in 2003, uh, we've had uh, a revenue that was climbing. Essentially, the economy was good, and the revenue that we get from the sales tax uh, that then proportionally based on population is received by the city of Glendale, uh, that revenue uh, from ANC was growing. Uh, by the same token, uh, you know, as, as any other service that you provide, it's a fixed route service and a dialer ride service. Our expenses were growing, but we were able to always stay below uh, the total dollars uh, that we were spending uh, versus our revenue. Uh, in 2009, 2008, 2009, with the economy the way it is, obviously the revenue from Prop A and C receipts have dipped down. Because we have less, we're getting less funds from Prop A and C to the tune of approximately $720,000 a year. And as a result, if you look at our expenses that have gone up because we contracted out our services again, we, we, every five to seven years we contract out our services, the cost of providing service due to increase in wages, union wages that we pay, uh, cost of fuel, as you all know, have gone up, and, and other administrative costs, our expenses are higher than our revenues. Uh, so. We've looked at, since 2008-2009, how, how we're going to close the gap, because if you don't close the gap now, uh, that gap is going to widen and widen, as it's shown in our project projections. Uh, in the next five years, that gap of will be approximately $17 million, where we are spending more than we're taking in. So our goal was to look at that gap, 
how do we close the gap with a number of ways? One, obviously to look at the uh, service levels and see where what efficiencies we can achieve. Those are the three options that our staff in cons consultation with our consultant have uh, uh, come up with that will show every route has been looked at and uh, we can make service changes or reductions on each one of these routes that we operate, B-Line Route 1 through 7, and our express services that are provided for the Metrolink uh, express lines, as well as our dial a -right service. We look at the service levels and see if we can change the service, re uh, reduce it, restructure it to the extent possible. Uh, by the same token, we have to look at the revenue side and how do we increase revenue. In transit, your sources of revenue, either it's, grant, uh, it's the uh, government funds uh, or your profit in C dollars that you received or the fare box revenue that you have. We have a very low fare box revenue, about 6.4% of our revenue is coming from our fare boxes. With the latest uh, uh, provisions that we have, we need to get to about a 20% fare box revenue like other large transit agencies. So we've developed fare structure that would essentially get us to a 20% uh, fare box return. We will, in, in other words, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It will be built up to that level. Uh, uh, over time, and at the end of the five years that we're projecting, we're hoping that if everything stayed the same, uh, we didn't get an increase in the uh, improvements in the economy, which translates into more revenue from Prop A and C, uh, and our service levels stayed the same. We're not adding more service. We're trying to make it e efficient, reducing areas where we don't think it's productive. Uh, we can get to a point where uh, we feel comfortable at least maintaining the core service level within the city of Glendale. If revenue picture changes and things improve better, we can always go back and look at the service changes and add more service, uh, improve the frequency of service that we're recommending right now to go, for example, from a 20-minute to a 30-minute frequency. We can go back and look at those. Uh, so that is our goal that we have put together packages that ideally you don't want to cut service as much as you can. But that comes with a price, which means a higher fare increase. If you go with a moderate uh, service cuts, there's a moderate increase in, uh, in fares. If you go with a, a major service cut, there's less increase in the fare. So it's, it's a combination of pack, a, a three package combination that uh, Ms. Engel, our transit manager, is going to walk you through that. Our goal today is, because this is the first time we're presenting this to the Commission and in the public, is to get your input on, on these options, a combination of options of service changes and fares in combination, either it's option A, B, or C, and if there's areas that the Commission feels strongly about it, uh, we'd be happy to look at those. And then uh, in the next 30 days, uh, before September 21st, which is our study session with the City Council, that uh, we will then present the Commission input on these options. Council has not seen these options yet. This is the first time it's coming to the Commission. And then also receive input from interested parties, obviously the riders, the B-9 riders who ride will be impacted, the most impacted by both the service changes and the fare increases. Uh, major employers in the in the city uh, that are uh, using, for example, the Metrolink, Metrolink Express services. Uh, Glendale Chamber of Commerce, uh, we receive input from the Glendale Chamber of Commerce. Glendale TMA, that is an association of all the majors, major employers in the city. Get all their input, uh, and in the next 30 days, also present that as part of our presentation with the Commission input to the City Council on the 21st of September. Once we get Commission uh, Council's policy direction on the level of fare changes as well as service changes that Council feels uncomfortable with it, we will package it again, repackage this again, bring it back to the City uh, Transportation Parking Commission for a final recommendation. So today you're giving us your input on the various options and if there are areas that you feel uh, you like us to analyze further, we'll be happy to do that. Get your input so that we can gear up in the next three weeks, put another uh, presentation or staff report that will be presented to, to the City Council. 
uh, at the September 21st. Once the timing and the date is final, the date is confirmed on the 21st, it could be a 10 a.m. presentation to the City Council study session. I will confirm that, and I will make sure that the commissioners are aware of the date and the time of the study session. So, Mr. Chairman, if that is okay with you, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Engel to have uh, a presentation of, kind of give you a, an overview of our line by line analysis of what we did in the line by line analysis and go through each one of the routes and tell you why, for example, the ridership in the morning or the late trips are low in comparison to the you know, peak hour ridership and why are we trying to cut some of those services or reduce it, change the frequencies. And then at the end, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that the commissioners have. And uh, with that, we'll make, make sure that we get all your comments, and then we can present them to the City Council. Okay, very well. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Walsh, and uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, the, what we'd like to start off with, Anusha, if we have the next slide, um, is just a, a very um, high-level kind of summary of what uh, we had presented before um, the commission uh, with our line-by-line -line survey. The first slide shows us a little bit what our um, transit orientation index is um, and where most of our service is. You'll see the routes in pink and in blue. Um, pink is metro and blue is beeline. And um, the darker the color on the map is the uh, higher um, uh, density areas, the more transit-oriented areas that we have in the city. And you'll see where those pockets of, um, of ridership really equates um, very closely with the ridership we have on the, on the routes. Um, so Route 4, which is Chevy Chase, Broadway, and Harvard, down in the core uh, lower third of your um, screen, um, has 67 passengers per hour. And you can see that the density is there and the, the um, uh, proclivity to use um, service, transit services um, seems to meld well with that route in that area. You'll see other areas of um, the city that are less dense and um, you'll see the ridership numbers equate um, to that as we go through the, the process. Um, next slide. So we wanted to remind you that we are very, uh, we have a very transit rich environment between the metro services and beeline services. Um, riders don't have to walk very far to get to a connecting transit service. And our whole role um, for beeline is to be that feeder service, the <coughs> connector to the regional service, which, which is in our case, metro. Um, a lot of our metro services in Glendale run 24 hours. Um, many of them run really frequent service. Um, so our job is really to make those connections, get people from the neighborhoods or from their work environments to those mainline carriers um, to be able to um, give them mobility in and out of the city. Um, as most workers, as we've learned, um, most people that live in Glendale don't work in Glendale, and most people that work in Glendale come from other areas. Um, so we're very dependent on the regional transit services to move people in and out of Glendale. Uh, next slide. Um, just a reminder again from the line by line is what the intensity on our routes are. Um, route three and four are the, the most used routes of our system, fo uh, followed closely in route seven. And others that everyone always kind of thought, uh, the central and brand uh, routes on route one and two, um, everyone thought there was a lot of ridership. There's actually less ridership on those routes and they're comp comparable to routes five and six. Um, so you'll see in our numbers that the predominant number of riders are on three, four, and seven as we go through this process. So just kind of a snapshot as we go through and look at line by line. Um, so with that, we'll go to your exhibit one in your um, packet for this evening. Uh, and if, it, if it's uh, okay with the uh, chair, we'll just look at each route and we'll put up on the screen what that route is. So. Um, we'll have a new move to Route 1. Um, and Route 1 and Route 2, I'll remind you, are a little bit funny because right now they both operate on central and brand. Um, they run in a clockwise and counterclockwise um, direction. Um, so Route 1, we would call that the central, the main central service because you're going from GTC or the most dense part of town north on central. Route 2 would be north on brand. So we've separated the data to kind of give you a clearer picture of a Route 1 and a Route 2. In this case, um, and let me just, 
Route 1 is the Central Avenue data. So it, we're really talking about changing Route 1 into Route 2, because most people think that Brand Boulevard is Route 1. And so we're doing a name change, and that's why I said this will be a little bit confusing tonight. So the data you're looking at right now for Route 1 is really central. It's going to be Route 2 on your spreadsheet. Because in our plan, we're talking about moving, calling brand service north and south, Route 1, and renaming Central Avenue service Route 2, both north and south. So it's a little bit easier for the riders to know which route they're on and which street you're talking about. We're talking about which bus routes. So the, it gets a little simpler after routes one and two, but uh, so it'll say route one on your slide for central and route two on your spreadsheet is the Central Avenue service. You'll say where our first proposal is to rename service on central to Central Avenue only. And we're proposing to reduce the service from every 20 minutes to every 30 minutes. Uh, and with that, cancel the first and last trips due to low productivity. So I gave you what the annual ridership information is for weekday ridership at the top and then gave you some of the data for as we make our recommendations or our discussions of if we were to um, look at option B or option C and if we were to cancel Sunday service, for instance, how many riders that we would be affecting and what our ridership per hour is when we're talking about that compared to our weekday riders. So predominant um, ridership on our routes is weekday service because we carry mostly working folks and school folks. Um, and so our weekends are, are much less productive and are the first that we would look at for um, service changes. So under option one, which is a minimal service cut, we would be looking at changing headways. Instead of 20-minute service, we'd look at 30-minute service. Uh, we'd look at the first and last trips. Uh, which are not as productive and um, look at canceling those trips. In option B, we keep everything we talked about in option A and then consider whether or not we should cancel Sunday service, with Sunday service affecting 305 passengers. In option C, which would be the biggest service cut, we could consider cutting Saturday and Sunday service. And you'll see on Saturday our, high, our ridership is a little bit higher um, and our productivity is a little bit higher. So in that case, A would be our preference if we were trying to reduce the, only cut the inefficient service. B is a little bit more painful because you're losing that weekend connectivity. And then C closes down our weekend service on Central Avenue altogether. Okay, next slide please. So we'll go to Route 2, which is brand only, which on your spreadsheet then is becomes the route number one. So we're talking about renaming it to brand only to simplify this issue we're having tonight. Um, we do the same thing, reduce service from 20 minutes to 30 minutes, and then operate the weekend service um, because most of the stores don't open till later on Grand Boulevard, is operating from 11 to 5. So we cut a few hours of really inefficient service in the morning and carry, still operate while we have most of the passengers riding in the afternoons. On option B, we would consider canceling Sunday service. So again, the ridership on both Central and Brand are pretty similar. Um, but since Brand is our core shopping district, we would probably um, not recommend an option C to cut us a, uh, a Saturday service from Grand Boulevard. So similar effect on both streets, 20 minutes to 30 minute headways, cutting some early and late trips where we don't have a lot of ridership. Um, and the, the most severe impact that we're talking at this point is cutting Sunday service on Central or Brand or both. Questions on Route 1 or 2, because I know it's a little bit wacky with uh, different directions. Why on N1, N2, when you say like 2, brand only, it still runs in Central? Or am well, I losing of something? Yeah, in, in, the, in the study that we did, that when they separated out the maps, right now it currently runs with Route 2 on brand, goes north on brand first, comes down on Central. So this is the existing... This is the existing route. Existing 2. Going forward, 2 will only be on brand? 
both directions. One would only be on brand, and two would only be on no, north and south on each. Right. So this is the existing designation. Right. So the bus, technically, the bus is still going to do this movement, but when riders see the bus, it'll say brand route one. If you're on brand, going both directions. Oh, no, I understand that. Okay. So right now, if you go to the GTC, you have to sit there and think, am I going north on Brand or north on Central? Which bus do I get on? So it'd be so the bus will follow the same route. It's just at the top at the apex, it'll change its it'll, sign. It'll change the head sign. Got it. Okay. So that it's really clear. One's on Brand as our premier street. With <laughs> nothing against Central, but Central as uh, being the secondary street as far as ridership. Uh, be much clearer for the passengers. When you did your ridership survey, did you do portions of the route, like south portion versus the north portion, or some variation? Uh, we did collect data in segments, and that is in um, your chapter two of the line by line analysis. It'll have all the different segments and what that ridership was in segments, and you'll see how, how where that's very important when we look at route three. Um, the ridership on one and two, because of of how the buses move and what people understand about the route, are fairly equal. Um, it's just the time of day that is different depending on where they're going, weekday versus weekend. They may not go to Central where they might spend more time on brand. So if they're going to eat, they're going to go on brand, but if they're going to work, they might have gone up Central. So it depends on which bus got them first and got them close enough to where their destination was. Um, I don't want to get, we probably want to talk more about it later, but for instance, if on one and two on the weekends we cut the, we eliminated the southern portion at some point, Colorado or some Chevy Chase or something, does that, can I be analyzed, does that help? Rather than eliminating it entirely, just eliminating the southern portion, say, on Saturday and Actually, Sunday. Um, in this case, for, for both routes one and two, the southern portion drives the ridership. Right. So if you were going to eliminate every, anything, you would eliminate everything north of Dorn. Okay, and so really the same question then in reverse. <laughs> I got you. No. So, but the the, the 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 ridership is generated from um, Broadway South for both routes. No maybe, matter what day. When we is. talk later, maybe we can talk about is it feasible to keep service more frequent or keep it on given on a given day, but lop off under these <clears throat> portions on the weekend. We certainly don't need to go to GTC on the weekends that we would have to find a place to turn around and also provide a driver relief point. So we can, if we can do that farther north on the route, then we can trim some miles and trim some time with it. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a great question. And that would apply to any of the routes as we go through. We can take pieces off as long as it makes sense for how many buses and how many drivers we have out simultaneously. Because that's where we save the money is the number of buses on the route or the length of time drivers are actually behind the seat uh, running that route. That's where our, our cost is. Um, yeah, I had a, a couple questions. Um, the first, what about the issue of duplication and the Metro 92 in that area? And number two, did you do any, um, I guess, a straw polling of some sort or to find out from the Americana how successful their 11 to 2, p uh, 2 p.m. trolley is doing, which is free of charge? I know it's only a, a limited segment of brand, but that would be a curious thing to find out um, the duplication that's happening on this route. Um, uh, this one and two is an issue for me. I want to see what we know more. If okay. you could tell me about that. Um, I have to remember if I remember all your questions. Let okay. me answer the trolley first. Uh, right now we're not seeing any change in ridership with the, with the addition of the trolley on um, Brand Boulevard. Um, I don't have any information about the trolley or the, the data, that if they've collected data for that. Um, that's something that uh, Mr. Bogdani could, could look into for us. Um, but it hasn't affected our day-to-day -day ridership um, because, again, we're carrying mostly people to work and to school, okay. and the, the trolley doesn't um, provide that purpose for us. The, the duplication with the uh, Metro line, with the 92? With um, Metro 92, Metro 92 actually is what we call long haul service. So it starts in downtown Los Angeles and goes out to um, the valley. So the, a lot of the folks that are using that are using it to, to move through Glendale versus move in Glendale. Um, so what's nice about the 92 is if we were to trim service morning and evening, there's another option for folks that has fairly frequent service that they won't be abandoned if we were to not do a weekend service, um, um, a Saturday or a Sunday service. There's still some reliable regional service for them right. to depend on. Okay. So right now both the uh, product, and that's partly why our productivity on Brand Boulevard and Central are, are lower than 
what our normal 40 passengers per hour would be, um, is there's a lot of service. There's a bus like every five minutes on Brand Boulevard. So if you have lots of options, a lot of riders will pick the first bus versus, oh, I'll only ride Beeline or I'll only ride Metro. Um, so because there's such frequent service, um, you know, both Metro's boardings in that area and our boardings are both low. When they get out of Glendale, the boardings are very are higher for Metro because we're not there. So Metro would like for us to withdraw our service um, because it would help them productivity-wise and it might be an efficient use of, of resources. Okay, with that, we'll move to um, Route 3. And Route 3, um, a lot of people call this the college route. It's the, the Glendale, Verdugo, Honolulu, La Crescenta, Foothill Boulevard route, if you're going by the, the streets we travel on. Um, the, um, this is one of our highest ridership routes. We have 3,700 weekday riders. Um, and what's interesting, if you look at the bottom of the chart, is 51% of the riders on Route 3 travel between downtown and the college. That's over half of the ridership is using a third of the route. Between the college and Montrose, um, so that would be the college in Honolulu, another the next third of the route, 10% um, of the ridership rides in that segment. Between Montrose and um, and JPL, so our, our La Cunada service, we have 39% of the ridership is in that segment. Now, what happens at the very top, uh, where you see to the left um, and you start to see the dotted lines, is those are two very high connection uh, transfer points to Metro 90 and 91, which also go out to the valley. So that's the last chance they can ride B-Line and transfer to a long-haul Metro route. So we do have a lot of ons and offs in that area um, where they're making connections. There's other places along the route for them to make the connections, but once they're on, they just ride till Basically, they're at the end and then transfer on Foothill, closer to Foothill Boulevard. We do have um, quite a bit of service that we sell to the city of La Cunada, Flint Ridge. Um, and those are not, the service we sell to La Cunada is not included in the numbers that you have tonight, so I'm giving you just pure Route 3 numbers. Um, but on top of the service that we run on Route 3, along Foothill to JPL, um, La Cunada runs a, an all-day shuttle service. And then they've, we're just right now preparing the final steps for them to do a service change um, starting next week that will run an afternoon service. Um, they were running some peak morning service that was not getting any ridership. They made the change to put that in the afternoon to pick up all the school kids. There are, I think, 10 high schools on Foothill Boulevard between the private and the public schools. Um, we have overcrowding um, between 2 o'clock and 3.30 in the afternoon. It is standing room only. The buses are just um, busting out the, of the seams. Um, so we were able to um, um, help La Cunada reshuffle their service so that we have more buses in the afternoon where we have a high ridership. Um, what happens is parents are taking their kids to school in the morning, so our ridership is very normal, taking a lot of folks um, to and from work on the boulevard, but it um, almost quadruples in the afternoon um, when the school bells, um, between the 2 o'clock and the 3 o'clock school bells. Um, so we're very thankful to um, uh, City of La Cunada Flimmerich for doing that. Um, in their service change and with their new buses, their old um, turnaround does not work for them. And so we were running the service through some residential streets for it to turn around off of Ocean View. Um, that was not satisfactory to some of the residents in, in La Cunada. So the city has agreed to run the service down Ocean View to Montrose and to turn around um, there at Montrose. Um, on Ocean View and Honolulu. <clears throat> so we have another um, kind of a nice um, service uh, piece where um, starting next week we'll run from um, the Montrose Shopping Center all the way to JPL um, with uh, City of La Cunada support for doing that. So on our service... Um, Is that completely paid for by La Cunada, the dotted portion up there? Um, currently, everything that we call it the LCF shuttle, the La Cunada Flint Ridge shuttle, and then the afternoon um, extra service for the shuttle, is um, they purchase that 100% from the city of Glendale. We provide that service for them. So 
Again, does that mean that all of the dotted line is blocking out it, or just no, it's first from Ocean, Ocean View. Basically, at, right now it's from Ocean View to JPL, and starting next week it'll be from the Montrose Shopping Park to JPL. All, all locking out of funded. Yes, though I do expect that they're going to come back and ask us to help pay for the little Montrose Shopping Park addition. So depending on our discussions, uh, if we have extra money left in the cookie jar, we'll come back and, and look at that. Um, so for the recommendations, uh, because we have over half of the trips are running between downtown and GCC are like ha half of the population that's riding the, the bus is in that downtown segment, we're looking at um, changing the service so that every other bus runs up the whole route to JPL and the other trips we just short turn at the college. So we'll save a lot of, um, of operating time and hours between the college and La Cunada, where we have underutilized service right now. Um, and so we think that's probably a wise, it's, it's the largest um, service reduction as far as, as dollar savings, but it affects probably the least amount of people in that process um, because we'll still operate every 40 minute service instead of every 20 minute service, but we're giving the, we'll still maintain the core service in downtown where we have over half of the riders um, traveling between downtown Glendale and the college. Um, we have um, a recommendation to cut the first and last trips due to low ridership. Um, it has decent ridership, but it's below our normal 20 <coughs> or minimum 20 passengers per hour. Uh, we try to keep a 40 passenger per hour um, um, productivity. We're recommending, because that's such a, um, a large amount of service to reduce on Route 3, that of all the options, we wouldn't take any additional service off of Route 3, because that's a changing the service um, every other trip to JPL is pretty significant. So we wanted to leave that as, as the base. Okay, so you, that means you would not consider then reducing service from 20 to 30 for Route 3? That's correct. We, we keep, because what will happen for downtown, it'll be 20 minute service for the first segment, and then 40 minute service, because basically every other bus would go up to JPL. So if in a worst case scenario I wanted to go north of the college and I was on the number three line, I'd have to get off at Glendale College and wait a maximum of 20 minutes before another bus would come that would take me up there? That's correct. Okay. I, I notice you don't have weekday ridership for this? The weekday ridership? I mean weekend, I'm sorry. Um, we do. So for Route 3 on the weekends, do you want the, the passengers per hour or the total count? Whatever's most meaningful. I mean, is there a big drop off because student schools might not be in session? Huge, huge drop off. We on Saturday, 648 riders, and we don't operate it on Sunday right now. Okay. So that's to say that our core ridership is weekday, business, and school. So on Saturdays currently, and that's where the dotted line comes in, we operate between downtown Glendale and um, Lock, um, Lock, La Crescenta, this, the street La Crescenta. Um, and we've been doing that for a number of years, so we're only doing part of the route on Saturdays as it, as it is. City of La Cunada Flinders does not provide service on the weekends. Um, and so again, their core ridership is, is work and, and school also. Do you, do you have an idea when you say a short turnaround for Route 3 at the college, where exactly will that be turning around? It will happen at the same um, stops that we have now. We have a northbound stop um, on Verdugo, just north of Mountain. So that will be the stop on the college site. And then it goes up and turns at town and comes down southbound at, at town. Okay. So it's, it actually, and the terminus. So it's actually uh, passing. So it passes Mountain to the furthest point of the college yes. and then turns left. And then on turns it. left on town and comes back. Very good. Okay. So it's utilizing current um, time points and current stops by And I believe that's also a, dry, a driver relief area, one, one of those, the southbound stop. Southbound is currently... So I've been on the bus when the drivers had to have some relief, so <laughs> they get off and run into the building there and then back to the yes, bus. Yes, it is a metro layover and uh, is a, it's a time point for us, not necessarily a layover, okay. but uh, that is a, one of the more convenient places to take a break. Okay, Route 4. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Um, this is Route 3, and as I mentioned, where the little black line is going on the top, that would be the every 40 minutes service. Um, and Route 3 on the downtown portion below the college to downtown would be the every 20 minute service. It was just a little more graphically showing you what the difference was. Sorry, Anish, thank you. On Route 4, this is our. Um, our largest route as far as productivity, you'll see our 67 passengers per hour. Um, this is what we would all love to have on every route. This means we're running very productive service. It also means on the day or the hours where we're only running 20 passengers, that you have 100 and you have a lot of passengers on those buses. So we have some overcrowding issues on Route 4. And you'll see um, this is one of the areas where we're um, looking at potentially at adding some tripper service um, to this route to relieve overcrowding for the, the schools. So on Route 4, we're not looking at changing any service um, other than the first and last trips due to um, lower productivity um, than the rest of the, the week. Um, you'll see on a route, um, I'm sorry, I didn't put that on here. Uh, we are considering if there is funding available that we would add a what we call a school tripper so the bus that would come out for Route 12, which is our peak afternoon Metrolink service, rather than starting at Metrolink, we'd run it out on the Route 4 first, make one trip, help pick up all those school kids, and then go into Route 12 service. So it's not a lot of money to spend to just have them do that one trip. We're pulling the bus out anyways. So if we have those resources and if there's dollars left at the end, that would be something we would play with to relieve the overcrowding. Other than that, there's no other change to Route 4. So between um, option A, B, and C, um, it's only looking at first and last trips um, for a low ridership. On Route 5, um, this is Pacific. This is a pr uh, <coughs> primarily a high school um, uh, route. Um, it services um, Pacific Edison Community Center and then the Hoover um, Toll Keppel um, Complex. Um, the ridership on the weekends, you'll see, drops off um, pretty dramatically. Uh, otherwise, during the week, it's, it's fairly productive. So we're looking at canceling the first early morning trip because there's not a lot of passengers on that. And then this is one of those where for about $7,000, we can add a tripper in the afternoon. Same thing, we'll, one of the buses we pull off for Route 12, we can put into Route 5, help to relieve some of the overcrowding at, at Hoover High School. Um, and so this is one where we would do a, basically a service addition versus um, a service reduction. Um, what we'd look at in the outer, um, in um, option C, if we were to really do severe cuts, is canceling Saturday service. Again, it's primarily a school route um, during the week, and there's less ridership on the weekends, but it's one of our only other main north-south routes um, to get through the west side of, um, closer to the west side of town. So option A and option B are the same. Option C would be considering Saturday service reductions. Okay, Route 6 is very similar to Route 5. Um, it serves um, um, also, Pacific Edison on the west and um, Glendale High School on the east goes through the core of on, on Colorado. Uh, we also have metro service on Colorado, so there is a little bit of duplication. Um, but our ridership is still pretty healthy on, on Route 6, um, 41 passengers per hour. Um, our early and late trips have some light ridership, so we can consider reducing those. and. Um, the only other thing we would look at is um, the running time for the route to try and improve its on-time performance. So maybe a couple of minute change here and there just to um, um, improve the, the service during the really peak, the afternoon peak overcrowding uh, with both traffic and the school loads. Uh, we get a little bit behind, um, behind schedule. So on option A and option B is just looking at the first and last trips. And then option C would be considering canceling Saturday service. Again, you'll see the drop off um, is not as, it doesn't drop off as much as the Route 5 on Pacific. Um, there's still 
450 passengers riding on Saturdays, but there is metro service there in that corridor. It doesn't go quite as far west, um, but there's less opportunity for people to be abandoned uh, because there is metro service in place. <clears throat> Just a quick question, Mr. Chair. Uh, the $48,000 in saving, if you're to cancel Saturday service, does that factor in the income that comes from the low ridership? Yes. It does? Yes. A general question for all your numbers. Have you factored in reduced ridership if the fares go up, as noted? Yeah, yes, we did. We um, And we'll talk about fares when we move to the next section, because we are... Um, we have a, a transit standard of elasticity with what happens when you raise fares. Uh, very few agencies look at doubling, if not tripling or quadrupling their fares. So our, our options are out of the norm. Um, and so we used the, the fare elasticity and then looked at other transit systems that have done similar things um, to say what was, their, what was the ridership impact? What's unique about Glendale and how much of an effect will that fare increase have on our ridership? So we are, our normal math science that we could put to it, we kind of did, but we had to expand that because we're so far out of the, the norm because we're looking at not doubling, at least tripling our, our, our fare increase. Um, but it, there is there is an automatic drop off every time you raise fares. You do lose passengers for a while, then it comes back up and kind of equalizes again, and yeah. it's kind of a, just a natural cycle that happens. Okay, so we're at Route Seven. This is the Glen Oaks route. Um, it's our only major east-west um, connector um, across town. Uh, it serves the um, from the Rancho area um, to the border with Burbank on the and the transfers with Burbank that we have um, on the west. Um, the preliminary, the the most ridership, we, the most people that use this ridership are going to Hoover High School and the college. Um, so you'll see the weekday numbers are very high, so about 1,600 passengers per weekday. Um, you look at the Saturday ridership, and it drops to 243. So it's really a school population we're taking um, between uh, middle school and the high school and the college. So for Route 7, uh, we're looking at um, canceling either the first or the last trip. Um, we looked at the last trip in this case. Um, we had recommendation to do either one. The, right now, the last trip has the least passengers. Um, we would reduce the service from 20 minutes to every 30 minutes and kind of fix the travel time. Uh, we get such heavy loads that our, our on-time uh, performance is, is hard between the construction and, and the school loads. Uh, we're going to look at adjusting the schedule so that it, it flows a little bit better uh, for both the high school and the, the college loads. In option B, we're looking at a possibility of canceling Saturday service. Um, again, our ridership really drops off. Um, the only caveat to that is it is our only east-west connector um, or beeline across town. Now, on Glen Oaks, we do have Route 92 that comes up brand and goes west on Glen Oaks. Um, it has very good frequency, so there won't be a, a problem with accessing service on Glen Oaks. Um, but it doesn't necessarily get the, the pockets or that total crosstown um, connectivity. Um, so one of the options that we had um, um, talked about, this not on the options right now, but we could run Saturday service and just run it to Brand Boulevard so it could make that east-west connection a little bit better uh, and not go all the way to the college because the, that ridership to the colleges isn't there on the weekends. Um, so there are some modifications we could look at if the money was right and the, the, the service combination we ended up with um, it would allow us to do that. We tried to keep it as simple as we could um, through, through these deliberations. Uh, for Route 11, uh, this is one of the Metrolink, what we call the Metrolink Express routes. It goes from the Glendale Transportation Center to downtown. Uh, we have fairly good ridership on, on this route. Um, it only operates during the week, and it only operates during the morning and afternoon peaks. 
Um, in the afternoon, the first trip, the first train that we meet, um, we don't have, very rarely do we have anyone on the bus. So right now we're kind of running that bus empty. We're suggesting we'll just um, eliminate that first trip, um, but not change anything else as far as ridership on that route, um, and try and adjust and fix the travel time. So again, it has good on-time performance and, and can be reliable in that way. Um, so no other changes to Route 11. And then Route 12 is our second Metrolink Express. Um, and this is a, a, a tough route to operate because we operate between two train stations, the Glendale Transportation Center and then the Burbank Intermodal Transportation Center. And the trains travel faster than the buses sometimes. <clears throat> so it's really hard to be on time at both ends of the, the route. Um, but it's interesting, the travel patterns are very different. Um, if you're coming from Orange County or from Riverside and you come through downtown LA to make your transfer north to Glendale, then you're gonna get off the bus at GTC. If you're coming from Antelope Valley or Ventura, then you're gonna come south on those trains and get off at Burbank. If you're going to Grand Central or um, it's, it's an easier, it's a shorter train trip and it's an easier connection at the Burbank train station. So one of the options that uh, we were giving you for consideration is we could save a bus, and so that's a, a, a significant chunk of money, if we just operated out of the Glendale Transportation Center. So everyone coming to Glendale, whether no matter where you worked in Glendale, you would travel, take the train to GTC, and then basically you'd backtrack on Route 12 to go back up the San Fernando Road corridor to Grand Central. Um, it does save us a considerable amount of money because we were, we were able to eliminate a bus out of the, the five bus rotation we have right now. Um, and then the, the most severe option for service <coughs> is because it has lower productivity than Route 11, uh, we're only carrying about 15 passengers um, per weekday. Um, is the potential to eliminate the entire route, which the commission had mentioned uh, when we met a year ago is to look at that. So that's the, the pricing pieces um, in, the, in the selection for Route 12. And then our last um, route is Route 13. Um, if you recall, years ago, um, Route 13 developed out of a cancellation of Metro 201 service in Glen Oaks Canyon. Uh, we put uh, all-day fixed route service um, between Glendale and Venice Hospital and um, the end of the, uh, the park, um, arcade at the end of the canyon. Uh, we have the same ridership that Metro did, basically two passengers per hour. Uh, we thought before we cancel that, we'll add this extension uh, between Adventist into downtown Glendale, thinking that maybe there's some east-west connection that would really help improve the service. Um, we did improve um, the ridership. We went up to 13 passengers per hour, but they're all riding in the downtown segment. They're not riding between the canyon and downtown. Um, so uh, although we do have some transit dependent folks um, in that area, um, they do have option for dial a ride if they are um, disabled or seniors. Um, and so because of the cost of that service, we've done everything we can to make it as flexible as possible. Um, right now we have um, five trips a day on fixed route and we take that vehicle and put it into dial a ride service the rest of the day. So we've gotten as creative as we can with the vehicle and the driver and the cost to do that. It's not very efficient at all. Um, and if we're just looking at the fixed route costs, the 44,000 um, dollars per year is could be used to add some tripper service to the schools or keep a weekend service um, on one of the other routes. Um, so Route 13, um, we're suggesting canceling the service because of the, because of the low ridership um, on all three options. It's a lot of information, a lot of data. Um, try to synopsize as much as we could from the line by line. This is mostly data from the line by line as far as the numbers and the costs. Um, just presented kind of in a different package um, for you to take a look at. Any questions on fixed route? And I'll talk briefly about dial a ride. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll keep on going. Okay. Um, for dial a ride, we wanted to consider a couple of, um, of items. Um, our dial a ride costs are, are fairly fixed year to year. We spend about a million dollars. Uh, we pay by trip. 
So it's not a cost per hour like fixed route transit services are. We actually have a very interesting and very unique contract um, where no matter how much time they take to pick up and deliver passengers, uh, we have the same fixed cost per passenger um, for, for making that passenger trip. Now the cost to do that, hopefully if they're efficient in their overall contract with us, they're able to manage those costs uh, for both employee time and dispatch time. Um, so if, if they're doing a good job, they can live within their cost per passenger trip that, that we have set. So it's very unique. And so when we talk about um, cutting back service on dial -a ride we talk about the number of trips, not the number of hours or segments of routes. Um, and those trips could be over five days a week, over seven days a week, um, but the most efficient um, reduction in trips would be to try to package them in the same hours or the same days. So you're not paying for dis a dispatcher with three vehicles versus a dispatcher with four vehicles and then still running Saturday, Sunday service where you still have the cost of that dispatcher and whatever vehicles you would have providing that service. So currently on the weekends we have two vehicles on Saturday and two on Sunday. So in option A, if we are looking at our fare, when we go to look at our fare increases, if we're able to increase fares a little bit with the, um, the dollar ride service, we're not recommending any reduction in the number of trips. If we're not able to increase our fares as much as we had um, proposed, then if let's say we only increase the fares by half, then there's about a $22,000 cost that we would equate that to trips. And in this case, it would be 1,225 trips. And so we would have a choice. Would we just eliminate Sunday service? And then some of those folks that would shop on Sunday would shift to a Saturday or a weekday service. Um, or we could, um, in theory, take a couple hours off of each day during the week or shorten Saturday and shorten Sunday. There's a lot of different ways we can do that because we're actually saying let's count, we're going to reduce by the number of trips. But to be um, efficient, it would really equate to eliminating Sunday service, which would force a lot of those trips to Monday through Saturday service, where we do have capacity um, to be able to take those trips. It's a little bit different way of thinking on it. Uh, a couple of questions regarding the dial -a ride service. This is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, something that's mandated by the federal government in terms of ADA and other federal law. The no, in this case, um, it's it's not. Um, okay. Our dial -a ride service is um, owned and operated by the city of Glendale. It is not um, the required complementary ADA paratransit. Okay, service that's what I was wondering. About. Okay, that's not the same. Um, thing. We are a member agency of Access pa um, Paratransit or Access Services. Um, they are the the official ADA paratransit provider for our beeline service. Um, so if we were to take beeline service right now, they have to do complementary paratransit transit for Route 13, for instance. If Route 13 goes away, then their territory shrinks a little bit um, as far as where they have to by ADA um, law. That's kind of where I was heading for because my concern was that if you're considering something like canceling Sunday service, what happens to those people who maybe live on a fixed route line whose Sunday service was also canceled? They're kind of hung out to dry. Right, so then at that point, access services would be the complementary okay. paratransit okay, required thanks. by ADA. So that is it for the service recommendations. And so the piece that we're looking at now is service and fares, and they would have to work together. So if we didn't want to cut service, we would look at higher fares, or if we wanted to um, um, not lower the fares as, as we've been presenting, then there's pieces you can pick in and out of some of the services that we can say, oh, well, let's, let's do Saturday and Sunday, but keep something else um, at the rate that it is currently. So there are a lot of options. In addition to what we've given you, we just try to make it as simple as possible on options A, B, and C. So on the um, fare policy for um, the fixed route service, uh, we've listed the, in the, your staff report on Exhibit 2, we have listed the current uh, fare policy. And this was also the fare policy and the, the discussion that follows it um, is, for the most part, based upon what our changes would be. Um, 
So our current policy for um, cash fares for B-Line is 25 cents. If we do option A, which we're calling the high fare increase, it would be a dollar for uh, regular riders and 50 cents for seniors. Um, it's actually seniors, disabled, and Medicare card holders. Um, this is a federal requirement. We are, uh, as I say, a federal system. We use federal money to purchase our buses. Um, so we are required to do what we call a half fare for these um, categories, seniors, disabled, and Medicare. Now we can set the age for senior. So one of the things we're trying to do is control some demand and also generate some revenues. So we're suggesting that the senior age um, be uh, moved up to 65. Um, a number of the transit agencies in our area are considering that or have moved to 65. We're all living longer and healthier. The more people can use the B-Line services versus the dollarized services, the more flexibility they have and the better um, cost impact that is to us. Um, so we're looking at both uh, at a senior age of 65 for both the fixed route and for the dollar ride. Um, option B then does a cash fare at 75 cents, and then option C is a lower um, fare increase at 50 cents. So these three options as far as fare increases match the three options of the service reductions. Um, so with, with A you get egg roll, I guess. Is, uh, you match up the A for service and the A for fares um, and some minor modifications, I guess, between the, the two of those. Um, Chairman uh, Welsh did point out that on the 10-ride card, um, we did transpose the numbers. The option A 10-ride card cost should be $9, and the option C 10-ride card should be $4.50. Um, I just have them uh, reversed. Um, they're both a 10% um, uh, savings over cash. Uh, the 31-day pass is a 25% savings over cash. So we are trying to reward the frequent riders uh, with a little bit of a fair discount um, uh, through those pass programs. I think the, um, uh, the fair media and everything um, is not changing particularly. Um, so the biggest change is really the the cash fares and how we want to treat um, cash for the, for the riders. Um, for the other agency, Fair Media, on the second page, um, currently our our express service has a dollar fare. We're proposing it to be a two dollar fare, and what that would mean for those riders that ride Metrolink is that our ca our fare reimbursement program for Metrolink, we're hoping to get the dollar, which is the half fare agreement, and then the other dollar would be made up with the Metrolink. Um, would be a cash fare from the Metrolink passengers. So they'd pay the same as any other B-Line rider at that point, um, but they're helping to subsidize more because the cost of their services is much more expensive um, than the fixed route service. So that's a change for Metrolink um, uh, pass riders or ticket holders, that they would actually pay a dollar um, on their fare, which would still be half fare um, with a $2 fare increase. And what's the prognosis of Metrolink actually honoring that and paying that dollar? Well, they've been talking for the last year about eliminating the whole program. So um, they haven't done that yet. So we're hoping as long as it's in place that they will honor our half price, um, our half fare agreement. But that could disappear at their discretion. That's correct. <clears throat> at any time. At any time. <laughs> uh, on the dollar and in fact, ride. In the past, they've not always honored even what we've billed them, right? Uh, we've had some discrepancy, but that was partly um, to our issue also with uh, having a computer crash and not having the backup data quite to their satisfaction. So it was, uh, uh, we, I think we split the difference um, by the time we were done, but uh, legit on both sides in that case. Uh, for the dollar ride fare media, um, this would be a significant change for us. We're suggesting that uh, we could charge $2 for a dollar ride fare. Uh, currently, it's a dollar. It's been a dollar since we um, started Dial Ride uh, back, I think, 20 years ago that uh, Mr. Bogdani had mentioned. Um, so we have a, a, f a handful of riders that also bring a personal care attendant. Um, if they're not able to to maneuver very well, because our service is a door-to-door -door service, and so if they um, need some additional care, sometimes they will bring a personal care attendant with them. We haven't charged for that in the past, but it does take up a seat in the van, um, and so we're looking at would we want to consider charging um, a PCA a dollar, a half fare, 
um, for their services or for them writing the beeline services because currently we do curb to curb one of the other options we're talking is some premium service if you need door-to-door -door service and you don't want to bring a personal care attendant that we can make that service available to you but at a higher cost because it obviously takes more time for the driver to get out and actually maneuver you between the vehicle and your front door or your destination door um, so we wanted to make that option available for those folks that um, where, we, where we haven't provided that in the past Option B is a little bit more moderate um, uh, fare increase, but it does mean that we should look at that $22,000 um, trip savings um, by reducing some service someplace else. So, um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a fare and service. Uh, exhibit three, just to make it handy, um, are the three options summarized on one page. So you have both fare and service combination. Um, you can take a look at, if, if you didn't like a piece of one or another, what you might be able to swap out with. So we're not going to go through that particularly, but it may be kind of a handy guide if you're looking at which fare, which um, option do we, do we like. And then to conclude, uh, my piece, uh, we did, we have received um, six public comments, um, I'm sorry, five public comments so far. Um, three were for um, uh, proposing that we keep Route 13. Um, and I'll mention it because I know they're watching tonight. Um, so we heard from Angie, Mrs. Corsini, uh, Mrs. Bucos, uh, Mrs. Corsini, and um, Ms. Muir on uh, trying to retain the Route 13. Uh, we heard from Ms. Sheffield, um, who would like to have option A considered, um, and also would like some additional evening service for Route 3 at the college. And um, from Ms. Um, uh, Hawker, who indicated that a fare increase for either Beeline or dial ride um, might prevent her from using the service. So those are the public comments we've received um, since we sent out the notice on um, Thursday night. And uh, again, we'll be collecting all the comments um, for the next 30 days, and we'll summarize those for um, the report to council. That, Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, a long presentation. I want to drill down a little bit into these uh, uh, revenue numbers um, for the options A, B, and C. Uh, a minute ago, you talked about you had to you couldn't use the, your standard 0.3 uh, elasticity for uh, the, the demand side, but what did you use? How did you derive these numbers? Uh, this is where I really relied on Dan Boyle's expertise. Um, Dan is known throughout the nation as the guru of fares. Um, he just recently rewrote the, the um, research guidance um, with a group of uh, folks for the um, transit research board uh, on fares and how what the fare elasticities are and how to implement fares so uh, of anyone that I know he would understand fares and and how to implement fares and the effects of fares on ridership than, than anyone I know and unfortunately we don't have him um, here with us tonight but he took his experience and his studies and said with Glendale outside of that normal fare elasticity formula that we use, what is the best case scenario that we could project um, so that we know the impact of 50 cents versus 75 cents versus a dollar and what that would be? So the numbers that we're presenting to you are his estimates based on our current level of service and how our riders, he's, he's very familiar with our ridership and how people use our routes. Um, and and presented for us, they're, they're his numbers he presented for us as to what we could use to, for a planning purpose. Um, and that's as close as we can get is it's an estimate for planning. Okay, well, I mean, because I'll be, I'll be frank, I don't, I don't see how uh, a tr a tripling, basically, in the fare, um, even or quadrupling with the dollar, wouldn't result in significant drops in passenger uh, users, riders, um, but I'm just not sure if, if, if that's, if, if they, they, he's reflecting a significant drop off or a minor drop off or what, that's what I'm trying to get to is what kind of passenger drop off 
is behind these numbers that we can expect? I can address that in general. Um, Metro's fare right now is $1.50, and if Beeline were to go to a dollar, there's not as much fare differential as right now where it's $0.25 cents and $1.50. If you're standing on a street corner and you can take the trip for a quarter, chances are you may wait for that next bus because it's going to save you enough cash to do that. When the fares get closer together, the, uh, the rider has much more discretion as to which bus they would choose to take. So do they walk two more blocks and just make a direct connection to their metro service, or would they pay a beeline fare and then a metro fare? Or would they buy a more expensive easy transit pass to be able to use Beeline, Metro, and the other 30 transit agencies in LA County? So it changes the dynamic of what their choice might be to ride Metro or Beeline. Well, well maybe so to try to add to what he's saying, is is he predicting a 20%, 10%? I mean, what are the percentages without getting into the weeds? I, I don't I don't know that to answer that question. Um, uh, I thought Metro was a dollar twenty-five. Did they just put in an increase? They increased their fare July first. Okay. I mean, I, I would just comment generally. I think a difference between twenty-five and fifty is different than a dollar to two. I mean, there's also the quantitative number versus. If you follow my. Point. Well, but at the same time, there's also it's been what seventeen years since we imposed the price increase. So I, I don't think there's any question we can probably affect a fare increase, but the question is just what that change is. Um, and I'm just concerned that, you know, a, a difference between 50 cents and 25 cents, considering that there hasn't been a change in 17 years, I don't think that that's a big difference. But to go up to 75 cents or to a dollar, I think that's a pretty big difference. And I'm just concerned about the impact on losing a lot of riders. In some cases, that will help us. Um, not that that's what our, our goal is, um, but where we do have... Explain that to me. I don't understand. <laughs> okay. Where we do have overcrowding on some routes, um, let's say Route 6, for instance, where they could ride either a metro route or a beeline route. Right now, they may get on beeline because it's cheaper. If the fares are closer together, they the ridership may spread out between the two routes. And so we would lose ridership, but we'd also lose some of the overcrowding from the, the school trips that we get. And, and Metro would maybe run more effective service because they're sharing the load in that corridor. So in some cases, it's kind of a win-win that the, we're really improving the, the efficiency of the mobility by using all the services out there, not having it uh, mostly beeline because of the cost. Mr. Chairman, if I can add, um, I think uh, you raise a very important question. And um, from my experience, you know, unless many cases this is a, a policy issue where until you actually change the fare, whatever increments it is, you really don't see the, the result. Now, definitely 25 to 50 cents may not, you know, deter a lot of the riders. But if you go 25 to a dollar, Obviously, it will make it. It should make a difference. However, there's also the demographics, as Catherine showed you on some of our routes. You know, it's it's a, it's the options that are available. Even though you can walk two or three blocks, maybe to catch a metro bus, but still the convenience of having a local service that you can rely on to go from, um, you know, southeast Glendale uh, to. Um, Galleria, for example, where you can rely on going to the college, you know, parents who, you know, have children or students who are using the B-Line, they go to the college as a, as a service. Those are the one, those trips I will be concerned because, you know, students, if they're getting pocket money and they have, you know, certain ink, disposable income, they are using it for their transportation. There's, depending on which demographics you hit, you know, the students could be impacted. Maybe they're walking three blocks. They can walk four blocks to get to school versus now it's only a quarter. They can jump on the bus on Route 5 and go to Hoover to Keppel. Uh, to be honest with you, it will be very difficult to 100% predict what that is. Obviously, the jump will have an impact to what percentage. We don't know. However, uh, since you have raised that issue, be happy. We, we will have some more further discussion with Dan Boyle to, you know, bring back to the commission and uh, obviously in the study session to say, you know, these are the reasons based on his experience and detail. And obviously from our experience, when we had the B-Line free, used to run free, and we went to a quarter, and, you know, in one or two weeks we had some reductions, 
but there was after that everything stayed steady. Again, it's only a quarter. It's very, very cheap. So we've also discussed the option of gradually increasing the fare. You know, we have a maybe a two-year plan to go to 50 cents, another year to go 75, gradually increase the fare. That's been also discussed among staff. Yeah, that was the to, plan for, yeah, the, for last that year. That would be that, that. There is obviously that option may, you know, as a policymaker, council can look at it and say, well, maybe it's just too much of a jump from that. The bottom line is we're de dealing with our finances where, you know, something has to give. Whether we raise the fares, obviously be concerned about losing ridership, which that's not the last thing we want to do. We want to keep ridership to the extent possible. The quality of service should be there. But on the other hand, we have no choice where we are back against the wall where we need to raise revenue be able to provide that core service level. So those are options that cons commission can consider saying, you know, uh, maybe it's too drastic of a change to jump to a dollar, but do it gradually. We did think about it. But once we did the finances, you know, and we that's why we packaged it with, you want to have the core service, then there's a price for providing that. If you want to have the average service, which is uh, option B technically, you know, it's a 75 cent fare increase, but it does cut more, but at least it keeps the core service, and maybe it's a gradual change, not a huge jump. So just for a commission to something to for you to think about. Yeah, I, th I think it would be useful to at least have, as imprecise as the numbers would be, is the percentage, the projected percentage decrease, and, and by number, because maybe 75 is no different than one. Once you bite the initial bullet, maybe that's the hard part. And then the second thing was, be, you, you mentioned sort of in passing, the ridership would come back eventually. Is that is that actually a, an S, something that the consultants say? That that is very typical of uh, of any fare change. Um, the ridership almost 100 percent. It, it comes back 100 percent, and sometimes then will continue to grow after that. Um, so after that first initial shock, and then the readjustment of of you know personal finances, um, it it usually within about three months. It's it's back up close to where... Well, three months, not a year. So you're talking almost virtually instantly in the scheme of things. Well, I would flesh that out more for us in council because the percentage, that's that's a that's quite a dramatic statement. It might be a little hard yeah, to believe. So if, if you I'd, have I'd proof, like to see that too because some of the things that I've read uh, in doing some research is that the, the long-term elasticities actually tend to trend higher than the short terms. So I'd certainly like to, to delve into that and make sure because this is definitely a big public policy issue. Um, and and since I, I would posit that most of the riders, particularly on some of the routes, like uh, Route 4, um, you know, are, are very transit dependent. And uh, they are probably the most uh, uh, financially impacted by a big price increase. So definitely okay. want to have all the information as possible. Chairman Welch, if, if I may. Um, I'm certainly very, very sensitive, um, as we all are, to this issue of the ridership possible decrease. And I know uh, Commissioner Weissman uh, was there with me at the MTA when they were proposing their um, their increase uh, implementation of that. And um, it was mayhem, at the very least, uh, to describe that situation. Um, my my concern, you know, before we get into the specific details of. The, you know how much, if any, the the B line should be increased in its fare is the the bigger understanding that recently Glendale was given the tier two status, operating status, and with that gives us the I guess a tap into the the growth over inflation part of the money from Proposition A. Um, with that comes, uh, I guess, with that with that. Admittance into that tier two comes the, uh, I guess, is compliance or standard of compliance that must be met um, in regard to fares for those that are part of this group. So, you know, we're talking, and if I'm understanding roughly, f a half a million to a million, perhaps that might potentially come to Glendale for their fixed routes. 
Now, I don't know if that was, I know this happened recently, this was last month. Um, that's a huge issue. That's something that um, involves a lot of exciting things. I know we're, we're kind of looking at this as a very sad, dismal fiscal situation for Glendale and its transportation, but with that status of Tier 2 comes a lot of opportunities. Um, comes the, you know, the idea, first of all, of light rail coming through Union Station to Glendale to Burbank. That idea is on the table. The idea of possibly taking over old metro lines um, is a possible revenue maker for Glendale. We have all of these possibilities now that we've now that we've come to the tier two level. Um, so the issue comes back to the fares, which is which you know we had we're, we're beginning to discuss. Is there, as we look at these fair options, uh, a standard, a level of compliance that we must meet to be in that group? Um, is that how the fare box ratio, 20%, is calculated? What, where does that play into it? But is there, I guess my question, is there that, com, that magic number? I mean, obviously, if Burbank is $1 and we're 25 cents, um, you know, that's, that's not, we're going to have to all kind of, you know, lift up our fares a bit. Um, could you address that issue in terms of the standard of compliance, anything that we need to meet in terms of the fares? Um, I'll, I'll try to address it, and I'll have Catherine's expertise, too, because she's... Uh, some of the technical aspects of it, Catherine is more familiar with it. But just to discuss the, the tier two status, you know, over the last so many years, we've been at Metro saying, you know, as a local transit operator, we're almost bigger than some of the what's called the included operators that they get federal money directly. And they're not relying on our Prop A and C dollars that we are. So we need to be like an included operator. However, those were approved by the state originally. There, you know, there's a certain pot of money that comes to LA Metro and the included operators, City of Los Angeles, Montebello, Santa Clarita, um, help me out, the uh, Santa Monica there's Foothills, 16. you know, there's 16 of them. They all get that. So the resistance all these years has been if another uh, agency like Glendale comes in, they have to share the pot. They have to get a cut from their share and give it to Glendale and so on. So through efforts uh, from uh, uh, Councilmember Najarian, Mayor Najarian, uh, in his involvement in the Metro, we were able to make a lot of headways after so many years working with Metro that we created another level of what's called Tier 2 that we're not tapping into as a guarantee. We will never tap into the included operator funding that they receive. However, well, the funding that becomes available is called growth over inflation, <clears throat> the pot of money that was sitting in the metro. Uh, we were able to put that money aside and the metro board allows City of Glendale, Burbank, Pasadena, and City of Los Angeles. We banded together, formed this called this tier two group, and we worked very hard to, to be able to capture that money. Our share of that money is approximately $1.8 million over three years, if I'm correct. That's already been built in in our uh, assumptions for the next five years. So, And the way they're giving us money is $600,000 a year. They're not giving us more. Also, the, the, the caveat is we get from uh, what's called national uh, transit data reporting, we get approximately $300,000 a year because we report our data to L.A. County. The county receives federal dollars for it, and they give us a percentage back of $300,000. With the Tier 2, they're going to back out. They're going to remove that $300,000. So basically, if you're getting $600,000 a year, there's a uh, possibility that they'll take $300,000. They'll deduct the $300,000 they were giving us. There's still a lot of discussions on that that we will try to work with Metro that they don't take that away. So. Uh, to go back then to the issue about fare box return, there's a level of effort that you have to maintain. There's, certain, uh, there's a lot of reporting requirement that we didn't used to do. Now we have to do that because you're receiving that type of funding. So there's a lot of administrative efforts that in order to get additional 300000 if that's the net we're going to get, we have to do that just to get that, that level of money. In three years, after three years, if that growth over inflation funding grows and there's additional money available, uh, as we will get our fair share of that from the metro. We, we mean city of Pasadena, Burbank, city of Los Angeles. 
If that money dries out and stays where it is, that's what we know today. There will be no funds, although we have that three or two eligible status. It is a very important step that we were able to achieve to be that tier two. We didn't think it's going to be happening, but because of our efforts with our neighboring cities and city of Los Angeles, we saw the metro saw there's a big ridership provided by these four agencies. So we need to we need to be recognized. Uh, as long as we stay out of the funding that is provided to the included operators that have been there for a number of years. And in terms of the fair maintenance, it's a 20% fair box return. That's what we need to have a maintenance of effort. We need to achieve that tomorrow. We're not going to have 20% fair box return. But we need to show that we're achieving that. And if we keep it at 4 or 5% at the 25 cent fair, eventually we'll lose that eligible operator status because you're not going to meet that requirement. Do all the options A, B, and C meet the 20 percent eventually? It, it... No. Um, option A meets the 20 percent. Uh, what the requirement is uh, technically is that there is a 20 percent fare box recovery requirement. If the agency fails to meet that out of the fare box, they have to make that up on their own dollars. So um, as it's reported out, we have, the, the agency would have to subsidize um, the, basically the fares in that process. So one way or the other, we're paying for it. If we don't raise the fares, we're still subsidizing. Um, and so our level of effort, we would show our level of effort by both fares and our subsidy for the fares. In other words, it will come out of our Prop A and C. Let's say we're at 14 percent or 15 percent. We have to make up that 5 percent difference to get to 20 percent from our A and C dollars, which are, we're hurting because of the reduction in the Prop A and C. Which you wouldn't have to do under Option A? We don't option, no. I mean, we will, again, if our fair projections are correct and we, we're, we get there with the dollar um, a fare increase, again, over time, as I said, there's a maintenance and effort. So as soon as you increase it to a dollar, we need to, we'll see what the revenues are. And if we're lucky, when I say lucky is we're, we're okay, we're right, we will get there at 20%. If we're not at 18%, we'll make up the 2% difference. It is a percentage. But the B and C give less of a fair box recovery according to your numbers? That's right. And why are we considering them? Just because it's a policy decision, how much we want to subsidize it out of A and C? That's right. Uh, I had some comments, but just a suggestion first. Not in comments yet. We're still doing questions because I've got public. Sorry. Okay. That's what I was going to ask. In fact, that maybe it would it might be a good time to, okay. go, to go to the uh, before. Yeah. So if there's no more questions, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. One more question. Why? I'm just curious why um, in the options there was no um, possibility of eliminating the 10 trip. Um, and the 31 day pass, because according to the analysis, it only made up of a few percentage of actual transit riders who use those. Um, would that, by eliminating that, um, increase our revenue in some sort by, I guess, eliminating the discount that they receive? Um, and was that a possibility, and could that be looked into? That's my question. Um, uh, Commissioner, the, there is a. There are uh, many, many opportunities and many possibilities. If we were to get rid of the passes, uh, right now they're not used very heavily because it's only 25 cents to ride. For those f folks that ride the B-Line often, it's the only um, ability for us to do some relief for those folks that are um, financially not as well off and may not be able to afford it. It's a little bit of a reward if you're using it all the time um, to save a little bit of money and still reward you for sticking with the beeline in that process. Um, so it seemed like a fair opportunity to be able to continue to provide those passes um, because I think at a dollar fare you will get more pass usage, uh, whether it's a 10 ride ticket or the 31 day, because it'll just be more cost effective for them um, versus the 25 cent ride. The, the um, original f um, pricing for the 10 ride tickets and the, the uh, monthly passes um, didn't have a, a really really good relationship to the cash price. So you could buy four of the 10 ride tickets and it would be cheaper than riding with a monthly pass. And you still get 20, your 20 weekday trips that you need. So the pricing um, points on those passes 
um, didn't really set an advantage for anyone to actually use them, and I think that's why our numbers are low. With the fare increase, it does allow another opportunity to encourage frequency on ridership and still give you a little bit of a cost savings um, if you really are a dedicated, frequent beeline rider. I have just one final question. What are the fares in Burbank, Pasadena? I just happen to have those with me tonight. <laughs> um, I'll be happy to pass these. Um, Councilman, just for the record, if you could just go ahead and mention some of them. Yeah, I, I, I'll, be, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I wanted to, while they're being passed around, give a little bit of introduction. We, um, when we did our fair survey and our fair study, we did look at the other agencies, um, and uh, um, we did a complete fair survey in February um, 2010. Uh, there have been some changes to the services, and so we did update the regional transit services as of July 1st. Uh, and you'll see the dial -a ride services on the back page um, are still from the February um, service. Um, it takes quite a bit to go out and survey all the cities for their, their fares, but we can provide that as we move ahead in this um, evaluation period. Um, so comparable, you'll see on the regional transit agencies, um, which we are, have similar service to Beeline as far as frequency and ridership. Um, Antelope Valley Transit Authority is $1.25 for regular cash fare. This will be regular cash fares for all. And remember, seniors, disabled, and Medicare card holders are half price. Um, Culver City Bus is a dollar. Foothill Transit is a dollar. Um, Gardena Municipal Bus Lines is a dollar. LA Dock Community Dash is 35 cents. Um, they just had a fare increase. They were a quarter. Um, and they have a couple different kinds of service. So we've only captured Community Dash in this case. And most of the Community Dash uh, routes are very short, and the trips are very quick. Um, so they benefit off of free frequency and volume of riders um, versus uh, um, Beeline where we have people that take generally longer trips um, in the service. Long Beach Transit is $1.25. Metro is $1.50. Um, they just went up July 1st. Um, Norwalk Transit is $0.75. Cents. Uh, Beach Cities Transit is $1.00. Santa Clarita Transit is $1.00. Santa Monica's Big Blue Bus is $0.75. Cents. Again, they have very short trips, very high ridership. Uh, and Torrance Transit is $1.00. So our average regional fare is $0.99. Cents. Um, so it puts Beeline right kind of um, in that target um, with very like um, systems uh, with very similar service um, and very similar ridership. Um, our local transit agencies are listed below. You'll see they kind of range all over the place. Um, $2.25 for Rancho Palos Verdes uh, Transit Authority, um, and the lowest being Monterey Park or um, El Sol, which is um, east, um, the county's service in East Los Angeles at $0.25. Cents. Um, they are usually um, fewer numbers of routes um, and um, are very much um, little or smaller feeder services kind of community circulator services. So a little bit different nature. Um, they don't always have as high a ridership or um, as high demand as, as the other local transit services. So out of the local transit agencies that are on here, Glendale is the largest by far of any of them by a couple of, um, we're, we're, we're triple to quadruple most of the other services. And we are probably in the lower third of the regional services that are at the top of your list as far as size and um, geography. So it kind of gives you where we are, how we fit into the, that picture. Um, for dollar ride services, again, this is um, from our February um, survey. The three agencies at the top are considered regional services. They are a general dial ride so they transport um, any person, no matter what their age is or abilities, um, because of the nature of their geography or how the, their um, system was set up. Um, they're basically shuttle services on demand um, for anyone in, residing in those cities. Um, and their Arcadia Transit and Long Rata Transit are both a dollar, and Claremont is 75 cents. Um, the regional transit agencies that would be um, similar to us that, that run a dial -a ride service um, that would be separate from their fixed route but usually run by the same organization. You'll see the prices run from $3 from AVTA 
um, 75 cents for Gardena, uh, depending upon the distance for LA DOT. Again, their city ride program, $2 to $6, depending upon zones, because City of LA is so large. Um, Norwalk Transit, 75 cents. Beach Cities Transit, a dollar. Santa Clarita, $2. Uh, Santa Monica's Big Blue Bus was 50 cents. And then Torrance Transit um, has a sliding scale based on income. So again, their, their transit services are very much controlled by their local policy makers and, and where they put the emphasis on um, uh, their, their senior and disabled ridership. On the local transit agencies, there's a number of them that participate in a dial ride program. Um, and, and theirs, again, are all over the map. We have 25 cent services in Covina and Manhattan Beach and $5 services in uh, Palos Verdes, $2.50 in San Dimas. Um, so again, depending upon the nature of the service and, and the geography that they're operating in, um, they're kind of all over the board as far as, as fares. Again, a local policy um, decision. So the average local fare for some of those local transit dollar rides are, is 83 cents on a regional basis, $1.38. Um, and you'll see it's closer to a dollar for the, um, the general dollar rides. Um, so, so the dollar rides in general are much more locally controlled and operated, um, have a little bit more flexibility than the fixed route. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open the public hearing. Um, I've got uh, two speaker cards. Um, uh, first speaker is uh, John Christopher. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to speak. My name is John Christopher. I live in Glendale. I've only recently started using the E-Line because I've seen it and didn't know much about it. I don't think most of the uh, working community knows much about what services are available and how much it costs, and whether or not it works for the connections they need. And I think that would actually be much more beneficial for what you need to do rather than cutting services, expanding services and knowledge into the community. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm using it is uh, I had to make a major car repair. I needed the car for my work, but the, it still it was more than I could afford. And so I'm trying to use a combination of the beeline and my sore feet to get to do some of my work. It adds a lot of extra travel time, and I have to weigh the cost of my time versus what I'm saving. But I know the metro line uh, certainly wouldn't help me. It gives me more connections, but it's too darn expensive. They are very anti-ridership. They don't allow transfers anymore. They basically lock you in the bus. You get on and you get off. You don't get off and, do, and get back on, so you don't really bring money into the communities they're driving through. It's something that's been killing all the small communities and why services like the B line can be very beneficial. The only reason why I know about this meeting today was I found these falling on the floor of the bus when I rode today. They were not on the bus when I rode yesterday. They were not on the bus when I rode Friday. I did find this when I, you know, I was first riding on the bus a couple months ago, which was a notice for a meeting you had in 2009, October. So at least five hours notice was a little better than uh, eight months late. But you can see why you're not going to get input from the riders. If they had to take a bus here, they couldn't get back because the buses weren't running. You can give us all the surveys you want looking from overhead on this puzzle maze. But if you're not looking at it from the actual rider's point of view, you don't know what the experience is of a rat trying to run the, this maze. You can say that the first and last bus rides on any line are smaller and worth cutting. But you can't cut slush. You can, only, uh, you can only cut prime. Look at all the restaurants that have gone out of business by saying our biggest businesses are during the lunch hour, so why should we open at 9 o'clock? Let's open at 11 and close at 2. But the customer that comes by at 10 says, well, they're not open. I'll come back in two hours. Now they've lost an hour of their prime time instead of their slush. And they eventually wind up cutting and cutting until there's nothing there. Yes, your first and last runs will always be people going one way because they know they can't get back. So you're going to have half your ridership on those. You can look at the Saturday and Sunday runs. 
On the Sunday runs, you have <clears throat> the one and two that basically connect to nowhere. And you have the four, which basically connects to one and two. So there's really no place you can go. There, it, it, they tend to have the Glendale bus arrive at a bus stop three or four minutes at least after the metro. So you can't take advantage of the fact that it's cheaper to get on the Glendale bus first and then transfer to a metro. If you look at Saturday service and the Sunday service, whatever you have, it doesn't start till after 9 or before 5. You're going to work at 9 to 5. That means you can't go to a job until after you, you'd have to be there. And you can't get back until after you've left to work. So I say look at how you could expand your services and increase ridership. Take advantage of people's economic choices now instead of trying to hurt them. You want to know what the elasticity effect is going to be? Take a look at the Metro. 20 years ago, they had 3.5 million riders. And our population has radically increased since then. They're down to less than 100,000 riders. They love the idea of cutting routes and this is what you're going to be doing. If you can cut your ridership down, they don't come back. They find alternative services that work for them. They're not going to come back. And what happens is you get an opportunity to cut more routes. And that's all that's going to happen. But I'd say, where is that connection we were hoping for between Burbank, Glendale, and Pasadena? If you do that, you'll increase a lot of your ridership. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Brooke, your person or so? Good evening, Commission. My name is Brooke Gear-Person. I'm the Executive Director of the Glendale Transportation Management Associates. The Glendale TMA is a non-profit private organization that works with companies within Glendale to establish employee commute option programs. Um, I wanted to, I probably shouldn't have sent a card. Um, I wanted to thank you for letting me know about this meeting today. I have not had a chance to meet with my board of directors. I will do that before the study session, and we will submit a written comment on several of your line changes. I can tell you, I can't speak for my board. I know that there's a couple options that are listed that are not acceptable, but there are other options that I can see my board agreeing to. So you will be hearing from us soon, and um, probably in more detail than I want to um, give at the moment. My one comment is the 17 years of no fare increase. You know, this is a horrible time to be raising fares. Every, I was watching the news Saturday. Uh, people rating their 401k is at an all-time high to try to get their kids through college. Um, and I, my one recommendation is if the city were to establish a more regular review of fares and routes, um, you'd be in a situation right now where you could say, hey, this is a lousy economy, we're going to wait a year. But since it's been 17 years, you guys are really in a tough spot, and I understand that. So my one recommendation is when you're through with this review, I would like to see some kind of a policy change that fares are looked at at a more regular schedule than every 17 years. So until my written comments, thank you, and uh, I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> I guess I will close the public hearing then um, and uh, begin with uh, some of our comments, uh, unless you had anything else to add? Or? No, Mr. Chairman, uh, be happy to answer any questions. I said uh, we are seeking your input on uh, these options, uh, various components of the options. So uh, our goal would be to have some form of a consensus among the commissioners. You all have individual opinions. We all truly respect that. So at least we have some indication in terms of what the commission 
together is uh, comfortable with or so that we can pass that on to the council, as well as if there are certain areas I jotted down in terms of the fair increase, the elasticity, and uh, the backup, and what percentage uh, reduction in ridership is assumed in that on the different levels of fare increases, uh, we'll certainly work with Dan Boyle and, and provide you that. Whether we can do that, uh, we'll, we'll try to get it uh, to you um, in writing uh, as soon as we can. I think that's an important factor, and as well as for council to know what would be the impact on ridership. So that, that's an important factor. We'll, we'll try to do that to, to provide you that information um, before the council meeting that we will have in September. Uh, so if you want to, in the, any way you want to approach this, we're comfortable with that. We want to take jot down your comments collectively, and then uh, uh, whichever option that you think we feel better about it, then we'll be happy to take that to the council. So since each of uh, options A, B, and C roughly add up to $2.1 million in a combination of fare increase and service reduction savings, is it fair to say that if you know we could figure out a way to find that $2.1 million, that that would satisfy what you're trying to accomplish? I think so. I think that that would get there. Uh, again, if you have a, a variations between these two options, I mean, between B and A or whichever option, hmm. it will take us some time to analyze it, but that's fine, too. We just want to know what you feel comfortable with, because... Uh, the reason, one of the reasons we haven't raised fares is when the times were good, we, we tried to maintain it. Uh, we had uh, we built up a um, what we call a reserve, so that from that reserve we can use the reserve in order to buy buses. We've been very successful over time by matching our local dollars with grant funds from Metro. Uh, anytime there's a grant opportunity, we have been able to buy buses. In fact, uh, Ms. Engel, just recently, <coughs> over, there were about 17 buses that we were 17 or 19. Uh, we, we just purchased uh, nine buses this last year, and Lot City of Lockheed and I also bought one bus. Uh, and we have a, another grant. Um, for six buses, um, that will be our next purchase, um, probably this next year. So in other words, the, some of, over the years that we've built up a reserve, you know, we match uh, whatever higher percentage match gets you a better chance to get these grants. So these buses cost three hundred seventy-five, four hundred thousand dollars. Using the our local match, we've been able to uh, buy buses, so at least we have a good quality service. I think one uh, important aspect for you to consider is at the end of the five years where we're trying to gap, close the gap, whichever way it is, whether it's by service reductions at, as drastic service reduction or by drastic fare increases or a combination thereof, at the end of the five years, given the fact that we anticipate still the property and C dollars will stay where it is or it will maybe climb up a little bit, we can use other sources of funding, whether eventually we'll be able to tap into downtown mobility fund and fund portion of our services that are specifically in the downtown using parking funds. That's a policy issue, policy issue council needs to make a decision on it. Is that something that we can make a recommendation uh, on tonight? Absolutely. Uh, it was originally part of the mobility plan, so there's area components of that that if the commission is interested, obviously that can be done. Uh, and so. It is a combination of all of these, and we can tell you that this is a, at this point, how what we know, what the fares are, and what the revenues are. Next year, we will be monitoring these as we have over the years and see. Hopefully, if Prop A and C grow and we on the plus side, we can come back and restore some of the services that we we have. Uh, but if it doesn't grow and it goes in the the wrong direction, we're going to be back to the commission and trying to not operate as a deficit, because the way things are right now, we're operating as a deficit. And the, the gap can grow over time every year that we're not. And the more we delay a potential fare increase, the, our, our deficit starts growing and growing. It's harder to come up, climb out of it. So that's, that's where we're by no means as staff, we're happy with uh, cutting service. Can you uh, refresh a memory in terms of what your annual forecast was for the parking meter revenue from the downtown uh, district? Uh, the parking revenue revenue is about uh, the brand meters are generating somewhere about $750,000 a year. We have to back up, to back out the operating maintenance costs of, of, out of that. 
roughly without having audited numbers, because that's also being done, we could be somewhere about $400,000 in terms of net revenue. That needs the decision council needs to make Mm -hmm. to allocate a percentage of that. Uh, Our our mobility consultant uh, had, you know, 25% to transit, 25% for maintaining current level of uh, parking in the downtown, some uh, street improvements and uh, helping marketing the downtown area because that revenue is generated as a result of parking revenue from uh, the customers who are visiting downtown. So those are options that can be explored as well. We are trying to make some assumptions that if we get $100,000 out of the mobility fund, let's say, plug that into our uh, transit fund, how much that would help us in terms of sustaining the level of service. Those are some of the issues that, since I don't know as council is in favor of that, we haven't really built that into it right now, but we will try to get some level of comfort with that or giving options to the city council or finance department finishes looking at our parking fund, because that could be hurting too. You know, we have a lot of demand on our parking fund as well. Okay. So who would like to begin comments? And- Discussion. Okay, Peter. Uh, yeah, starting with, uh, I'll sort of divide my remarks into, into route and affairs. In terms of the routes, first of all, I would eliminate Route 13, personally. The Burbank, the the, the Express, the Metrolink Express, if that were canceled, I guess 12, no, 12, I mean 12 is the one that goes to the Verdugo, yeah. I, I would eliminate 12, personally. It's 500, 000, almost 500000 almost half a million dollars in there alone. That's significant. Uh, the the Metrolink Express, that's route, what route is that? There's a route 11 and a route 12. Both are Metrolink one Express. One goes to Burbank and one just goes through downtown. Oh, okay. So if you cancel them entirely, that would be a total of about 52000 I'm guessing, seems like. <clears throat> So maybe that's not significant. So anyway, uh, again, I would cancel 12. Um, I would consider, uh, as you've done on the, on the GPL one, I would consider uh, maybe you can eliminate segments on weekends for various routes for low ridership segments. Uh, I think Commissioner Jacobian sort of touched on an important point. Uh, as the affair approaches a dollar, uh, we are more fungible with, with MTA service. So maybe, because if you look at this, you say, oh, my gosh, there's no service anymore. But if you factor in the MTA, like the 92 and the others, it doesn't look so bleak. So maybe in your presentation, you can also put down the alternative service on the route. So you, can, you get a little better flavor of what is available you know, to, to, the, to the rider. Uh, I first saw the dollar fare, I was sort of had a little sticker shock, frankly. But but then you show me this other chart, and you know I hate to say it, but a dollar is not unreasonable at all. Uh, but I'm wondering, because it is a four times jump, maybe maybe a stepped fare increase for just for 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 the public, so that everybody don't get complete sticker shock. But whatever the uh, whatever the fare increase is, because I, I, you suggested the B and C options didn't meet your 20% fare recovery, or I'm getting a little, I'm not tired. Whatever you do, I would make sure that happens. Um, so I, so just to summarize, I, I think if you if you can, I guess the notion would be is maybe you can do sort of an A, A minus, A, B, where maybe you end up at A, the dollar increase, because that's that's very market, but maybe it's a stepped increase, and, and because of the reduced revenue, because of the stepping, maybe if you consider segments and duplication, in just terms of, of conceptually looking at it, and maybe you can save some dollars here and there, maybe maybe you don't have to cut back the service quite as much, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I don't, you know, you sort of, um, I, I won't spend much time because I don't think, Saturday and Sunday service, uh, I guess, I say that would be a, a point for a reduction. Like, me doesn't have to go to the GTC on a Sunday or a Saturday. Serve Southern Gunnedale, but not all the way south. Those are my comments. Commissioner Weissman? Okay, a couple of things. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really ready at this point to start, you know, 
cherry picking the various options and say yeah, I'm in favor of this and I'm not in favor of this. I think they're all pretty much on the table. And what I'm hearing uh, so far is that there seems to be uh, a general feeling that uh, you know maybe albeit reluctantly, but at the very least a fair increase is something that uh, that the commission is definitely going to consider. Um, in terms of the amount, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the the elasticity issue. Maybe you know less of less of an issue with the lower end than it is at the higher end. I mean, from from twenty five cents to fifty cents is probably less of an issue than what we hear, say, in the metro boardroom, as you mentioned, when they're contemplating a fare increase from a dollar fifty to a dollar seventy five. Kind of the issue for me when I look at the residential transit orientation index for Glendale is that in general uh, the ridership is concentrated in the lower income areas of the city which means to me that the, there will be heavier impact felt for any perceived uh, price increase. But I'm kind of reluctantly of the opinion that we don't really have any wiggle room in there. We're at the bottom in terms of comparison with the other operators and given the current economic climate. I'm not sure that uh, it's, there's any possible viability for maintaining a 25 cent fare. I am willing to support fare increases, but there's a couple of things, a couple of issues that I would like to see get some attention that bear on that. The first of those issues is the status of our fare boxes. I know we've had some discussion uh, before this commission on prior occasions about the fact that fare boxes on buses don't always function properly and sometimes don't function at all. I'm also concerned about the collection of cash from those fare boxes and the depositing of that cash in the bank and the audit trail and the accounting that, that needs to accompany that to make sure that uh, the money that the city is getting, the revenue is being fully accounted for. And um, I would just say as a caveat for my support of fare increases, I want to see or hear that some progress is being made on our fare box issues because if we can't accurately count the amount of money that we're bringing in, um, I think it it undermines our uh, decision to raise fares. And so I'd be interested in uh, if staff has any comments about that particular issue and if you can tell us uh, when we will if or when we will ever have fully functioning fare boxes on all of our buses. Uh, yeah, Mr. go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, no question that our fare boxes are old and we, we would like to replace them. Uh, unfortunately, the, there is uh, basically one manufacturer that most of us deal with in terms of buying fare boxes. And in terms of the service and the quality that you get from that one manufacturer for repair maintenance of our existing fare boxes is uh, there's a lot to be desired from that respect, just existing. There is uh, a uh, countywide effort in terms of uniformity, in terms of having the same type of fare boxes, same fare media, that unfortunately started at a good note and it hasn't gone that far because many of the large agencies that we thought they would all band together, standardize the same in the fare box and the media so that Everybody, Just you know, the you top be, card system thing. Yeah, the top card system, and there is a major disagreement among the large operators, which basically are driving it. And we've been on the sidelines that said, "Okay, let's see who chooses what type of fare box and system. We will then comply with that, so we don't go buy fare boxes and then all of a sudden the system changes." It hasn't gone that far forward. In fact, there is uh, uh, grant monies that we can have. Uh, I believe it's about eight hundred thousand dollars. If I'm Actually, not, it's one point three million. One point three million dollars. We've applied, and we have a grant to buy fare boxes to replace our fare boxes. Unfortunately, because you know it's in a limbo as to what type of a software who will, uh, you know, what fare media to be used. 
that's kept us out of replacing the fare boxes. But it is on our uh, a priority for us, and I think the way it looks like we're not going to have a res resolution to it very soon. We may have just to bite the bullet and just buy those fare boxes, install them in our buses, and, and then hope for the best that countywide everybody will be you know, uniform and compatible with each other. Uh, but so there's you bite the bullet and buy the tap card system. Uh, that, well, not the tap card system. Buying new fare boxes that can be cash then, fare boxes. Yeah, cash fare boxes can be modified in the future <clears throat> to comply with the countywide system. So it is uh, our our intent to to get there. But there's no question that you know um, having good fare boxes so we can capture the revenue, making sure that it's accurate and it shows us what we're generating once you fare uh, increase the fare. Also have a better passenger count. If I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to also have, if Catherine has anything add, to add to it that makes helps you. Uh, right now with the grant money that Jono um, had mentioned, uh, we don't have an MOU for that money with Metro. Um, so we're, we, we couldn't go out tomorrow and just buy our fare boxes unless we're going to buy them on our own dollar. Um, and so looking at the things we're talking about, fare boxes run about $10,000 each plus the software to program them. So it's not a um, cheap investment. Um, they only um, get supported for about 10 years um, before um, the companies, there's only two companies that actually make registering fare boxes in this country. Um, they both joined up to do the TAP uh, program. Um, so there, there's not a lot of competition out there for our uh, fare box dollars. Uh, so we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. They're very expensive, and they very quickly go out of date or out of support with these fare box companies because they would like for you to buy the new version as we go along. Um, if I could address really quickly uh, um, an item that Mr. Uh, Council Commissioner Wiseman brought up. Um, the fare box system, from the time the dollar or the coin goes into the fare box to the time that it is actually pulled out and counted, is what we call a closed system. So there is no actual access for the driver, for a passenger, for a maintenance worker, for anybody to actually get to touch those dollars in the bus. So we, th we think we are capturing uh, and accounting for all of the cash that is actually collected. Um, what we've been trying to work on this last year, and you'll see that in our year-end numbers, is uh, we bought every used fare box of our generation <clears throat> that we could get our hands on here in L.A. County, and we pirated all the parts so we could fix our fare boxes and try and make sure they are all 100% working. Um, we have done that. We've used up all the available parts that we have. Um, and we continue to have six-month back orders with the manufacturer for other parts that we could not pirate off of these uh, um, surplus boxes. So we, we did improve the ability for the boxes to actually register the fares and register the ridership. So our ridership numbers um, look better this year. Um, I don't think we had an increase of riders. I think we've just captured the numbers better. Um, so we, we did do that. Um, uh, kind of, I call it a campaign to try and bring our fare boxes up to at least an acceptable level, level of operation. Um, but there, we haven't lost any cash through that closed system. And we're working with the bus operators and trying to really do some training to say it's important for you to capture every person that enters. Where we have the biggest problems is our crush loads at the schools, where we have um, a number of um, youth who are all jamming onto the bus at the same time. It's very difficult to actually enter, to count and enter them uh, when you've got front door, back door issues and, and overcrowding trying to queue through the, the line. Um, so we know our actual ridership from our line by line, the actual numbers are probably higher than what we're capturing or reporting. Um, and we're trying to close that gap over time with better oper better working fare boxes and also really trying to work with the operators to, to try and capture all the ridership as it enters. I, I appreciate the fact that this is difficult and it's been a, a problem to implement for the city and also that the uh, the technology may be hard to deal with. I was just reading in the paper that uh, Metro spent $154 million on locking turnstiles activated by tap cards that don't work, and so they've currently been installed and they're sitting there unlocked. Uh, so I realize you know, this, is, this is a bigger issue than just us. On the other hand, when we're talking about this revenue, this is a cash business, and it 
I believe it's really important to account for the cash that's that's flowing through this, especially in times like this when we're really being squeezed uh, in terms of our revenue. I don't know what the right answer is. Um, I'm frustrated about the fare box situation. I'm sure staff is frustrated as well. There don't seem to be a lot of alternatives. But I have to ask myself, if they're 10000 bucks a piece and they don't work, you'd be better off putting a plastic pail with a lid on it in each bus and having the people throw their money in that. It would be a lot cheaper, and I don't necessarily think the value added would be any different. So um, with that, I think I'll move on to uh, other comments. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sahakian, would you like to go next, or do you want to... I've said a lot today, but um, one one last thing that concerns me. Um, you know, personally, I'm not opposed um, to the increase in fare. However, there's this sinking feeling in me, and one of the speakers touched on it. Um, it I almost feel like, uh, and again, and I'm, not, I'm not putting our fate and future on the MTA. Don't get me wrong; that's not that's not what I'm saying. However, I do feel that after a year of interacting with them, of having a task force that we were part of, Glendale, Burbank, Pasadena, L.A., to discuss transportation issues, to kind of get this ball, and then finally be included in a, in a part of the pie, part of the, the revenue or money, <clears throat> then to not jump at the chance. Now, I spoke with the, the transportation deputy over at the MTA, and she was excited and head over heels for Glendale because she, in her opinion, found it was a fantastic opportunity for Glendale to start taking advantage of, of, of uh, some opportunities, revenue building opportunities. Now, I don't know firsthand exactly what all of those are, but I'm certain that someone in Glendale does know what those opportunities are. And um, I don't want um, and also she was mentioning the CEO coming on very creative, very enthusiastic, energetic, wants to work. I just get this feeling like if we're going to do an increase and, and there's no other way and it's something that we're stuck to do, I think it behooves us, and in all fairness, to make sure that we are doing the best we can to kind of not shrivel at this point in time, but to start you know, reaching out with our tentacles of transportation to start looking a little bit into the future, you know, I'm curious to see how Burbank will react to this and how Pasadena is going to start doing. But I, I think to give the message to the people that yes, we're increasing the rates and yes, now we're cutting this, 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 and this, and this. But we have nothing that we can see over the horizon, some exciting thing, something that's been presented that we can work with. Um, I, I just feel like that must go hand in hand with any fair increase with the I think that that's the very least that they deserve. And I personally would like to see what has come out of discussions with the MTA and th these, as the, deput uh, as the transportation deputy said to me, these opportunities that await for Glendale for revenue building. Um, I'd like to know what those are um, before I make the, you know, the average person in Glendale who's, who's you know, taking the bus um, have to pay for this. So that's where I stand on it, and it's just that, that general concern. Thank you. Commissioner? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, First, I'm, I'm really surprised that we had only three people uh, in the public. Uh, one or two things. Either uh, the notification didn't go out on time, or people took those boxes on the buses as advertisement, didn't look at them. But this is a big issue. Having only three people, it surprises me. It honestly does. Mm -hmm. Uh, or they might think that this is only a recommendation that commission makes to council, and council has the final decision, and they might see three, four hundred people show up at the council meeting. But I, w I wanted uh, to get more input from, from the public before making making any kind of recommendation here. But regardless, we need to move forward and, and, and make a recommendation. Uh, the difference between option A, B, and C, A to B basically is you're canceling Sunday service route 1 and 2 and Saturday service route 7 and GTC basically only on route 12. 
The difference from B to C is you're canceling uh, uh, Saturday service 2, 5, and 6, and you're canceling entire Route 12. And, and likewise, like Commissioner Fouad, Route 12 is a no-brainer for me. It's $456,000 in savings canceling it. But I would like to come up with a combination and not just say let's go down with A, B, or C. If, if, if service is needed, for example, on Route 3 or on Route 4, and option A is better than an option C for that specific route, that's what I would like to consider. Now, having said that, it's a math game. We need to go back and forth. And honestly, I didn't do that. And, and it's going to take some time to do that and come up, come up with, the, with, with the best scenario that, that has the least impact uh, to the ridership. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, I mean, we're all about mass transit. We need to keep improving mass transit. But I also agree with you that some of the things that we will do here will encourage maybe more bicycle, bicycling, will encourage maybe more telecommuting, carpooling, what have you. People will find other means, no ifs and buts about it. Now, having said that, I also think that it's time to increase the rate. It's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, 25 cents is, is, is too low to cover the cost. Uh, we need to raise it. But do I think that jumping to $1 is a good idea? I don't. I honestly don't. The, the, the number might, might uh, uh, look good, but we need to keep in mind who are these people that, that are, are paying these fares. And I'm really surprised that the, the, the age, the senior age, nobody brought that up. Uh, for those people, Social Security doesn't go up. Uh, they're on very tight budgets and the dollar 25 cents to a dollar will honestly make a difference I know some of those people it's not the majority but that's something also that we need to take into consideration I don't know how to close it I want to hear what you have to say <laughs> well I have a few things to say um, uh, because I, I definitely agree with your assertion about uh, route 12 um, again that you know I, I've, I've done a lot of digging into these numbers and analysis of these numbers and you know yes certainly route 13 is the worst in terms of what the city subsidizes per passenger but the route next to that is route 12 you know and the the route itself costs about the same to operate as routes five and six, yet only serves about a third the number of passengers. To me, that's just that just doesn't make any sense. If we have to cut somewhere, I think that that should be where it's cut. And yes, I know that the uh, 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 businesses will not be very happy about that, particularly DreamWorks and Disney, who get service from, uh, uh, I think, primarily Burbank Station, actually down the Flower Corridor there. But. Um, you know, it's it's these are tough times, and if we're asking every single rider in the city to to pay, you know, it seems like at least twenty five cents more, maybe fifty cents more, um, then you know maybe they have to figure out another alternative for for their commuters. Um, but I also looked at some of the other routes, um, and su surprisingly, after twelve and thirteen, the worst routes are one and two. You know, and, and I'm not sure exactly why they are, but in terms of the amount of subsidy that we cover for them, the amount of, you know, it's like a, a million and a half dollars in maybe even a million six in costs between those two. And <clears throat> if there's maybe some way that we can consolidate that into a single route that maybe just goes up brand or just goes up central, I mean, the 92 goes brand already. So it's possible that if we have to do temporarily cuts in services, maybe eliminating one of brand or central, probably eliminating brand since you've already got the 92 route going up uh, central to Glen Oaks, that might be a, a better solution short term. But let me first uh, get off uh, this subject uh, on the nitty gritty stuff and just talk about some broader issues because, you know, I think uh, the, the Mr. Uh, Christopher brought up some great comments that, you know, Cutting service and raising fares are, are exactly the opposite things we should be doing, you know, in the city. We should be trying to make more 
uh, service available. And, you know, I, I certainly understand there's a f fiscal constraint here, and we can't do that. So, so we're, we're it sounds like we're all willing to play along and help close this gap and, you know, give that uh, positive recommendation. But, boy, I would really love for us to start seriously looking at other alternatives. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Yacoubian was talking about, you know, giving a long-term vision along with these, this bad news that says, okay, in the future it'll be better. And I think one of those things that we need to do is really looking back at what we do to make cars and parking and, and the ability to access uh, uh, automobiles in the city much cheaper. In fact, to the extent that it's subsidized with free parking and, you know, 90 minutes free and all the free parking lots in the downtown area. But all that does is encourage people to get into their cars, and it, the impacts are felt on the streets, on the off-ramps to the freeways, you know, and, and the, the gridlock that happens in the downtown quarter. If we can possibly use some of the, the city's ability to generate revenues from parking spaces, you know, and, and I'm not necessarily saying a parking tax, but some way to generate revenues from parking spaces in the downtown area and divert some of those dollars to help support transit. So get people, make parking and driving a car cost a little bit more so that we can have the public transit be free or inexpensive and, and with more service levels. Anyway, that, that's what my long-term vision would be to try to bridge this, you know, and yeah, that's a 20-year you know, cycle that it will take to get to that point. But as long as we're beginning those steps, and I think putting the brand meters was a first step on that way, and I think that continuing to make step progress along those steps, and, and as we do that, make the public transit more available, more accessible, and hopefully free, you know, at, at some point in the future. Um, that would be my long-term goal. So um, that having been said, I think we do need to try and figure out some kinds of recommendations. As I understand it, we're going to be going into a study session next month with the City Council. Um, it will, that will give us another opportunity to talk with the council members about some of the things and some of the ideas. Um, but I think uh, uh, Mr. Bagdani would like actually to have some specific uh, recommendations from us. If we can at least reach some kind of a broad general consensus, you know, about some of these things. So uh, I'm definitely hearing a lot of pushback against the dollar. Um, so can we at least say that either the 50 cent or the 75 cent option we'd be okay with as long as we, you know, looked at the demand study and how much ridership loss there would be and stuff like that? But the way I would recommend calculating uh, that, that increase is after looking what we want to eliminate and see how much savings we have there okay. and then what we're trying to achieve. So it could be 65 cents, it could be 45 cents. Okay. Uh, but I think there's a consensus of canceling route number 13, uh, number 12, I apologize. Uh, number 12, I uh, was going to discuss Route 1 and 2, and I'm bored with you on that personally. It's only one block away, and these are tough times. If we need to cancel one of them for that type of savings, I'm all for that, honestly. We can always in the future bring it back. Mm. But it is just a block away. Right, and that's true. Uh, so that would be the second one. And, and, uh, and on what I would like to do is, is to discuss... The minimum level of ridership uh, on weekends that will meet your criteria of either canceling it or keeping it. And once we do that, let's add the, these amounts and then see how much we need to increase the rate. Well, if I may, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in opposition to a dollar fare mm. in a bit, but I think a step to increase. And the only reason I, I would even entertain the dollar is you look at everybody else. I mean, we don't... But, but, our, but people, driver, uh, uh, riders in Glendale don't compare themselves to... They compare against what is available in their pocketbook. Well, I mean... We Bur have very transit-dependent well, riders. I mean, Burbank Glendale. is a dollar, Pasadena is a dollar. Yeah, but they, uh, the people 75. in Glendale, they don't necessarily compare themselves against that. They just look at what they have to pay out of their own pockets. And well, we've got a lot I, well, of fixed-income people, a lot of students... You know, there, who would be very impacted by? Well, uh, well okay. Well, I mean, so I mean, in terms of a consensus, I would say I'd like if if we go to a dollar, and maybe we maybe we don't have a consensus for that. It, maybe it should be stepped to to get rid of the sticker shock, so that I mean, that we could maybe agree 
I mean, 45 cents, 50 cents, I think those days are gone. I think 70, personally, 75 cents would be the minimum for me. I mean, that's... Dan, I'm not ready to approve anything over 50 cents today. Fair Um, enough. Now, the other thing I I mentioned earlier on, without getting into the details, is can we, do we we have a consensus maybe on on maybe dropping segments on weekends of certain routes? Do we need to have the full route on the weekend for all the routes? And, And would that have savings? I guess another question, um, if we are going through the options, and um, as um, as you pointed out, we could kind of piecemeal what it is we could do with it to, to craft something, that wouldn't that affect, um, I mean, that would change the numbers around. Uh, and then that may put us in a whole different category on what kind of fares we need to deal with. So I think the fare issue, the actual number of the fare is a secondary issue. Um, First needing to deal with what's the best package we can put together, um, you know, looking at this analysis. So, I mean, that's my my thought on it is let's start with um, um, cutting this up and looking. I I would suggest segmenting on weekends, dropping segments on weekends, studying the duplication issue. Is a brand is served adequately by the MTA, that's a dollar fifty. But but that in Glen Oaks, maybe there, maybe that can be some reduction. I, I don't know how you feel about that, uh, Mr. Bagdania, Mr. Cherry. If I may, do we want to do this uh, in live session, or should we close the session, sit down, crunch some numbers, and then and then go back on, on the air and then give you a recommendation again, Ms. Sanson, your recommendation on that? If if we're allowed to do that, I feel a little. Um, awkward uh, pulling a calculator now, and which is what we need to do, honestly. Well, I, I don't think we have the expertise to do that. In, in, in we couldn't do well, that. Well, you hours. do have a very, very detailed study that was done. That part is done. I'm not looking at crunching numbers to change these. I'm looking at what options that we can come to a consensus of eliminating or changing, including the Saturdays, just just like you brought up. And then from there, if the gap is $500,000 or 400000 deciding what the fair increase should be. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I may help out. Yes. I think if commission, just as a suggestion, if you give us basically your general idea, I jotted down from each one of you what you're looking for. Uh, give us some framework or some you know, let's say the fair uh, 50 to 75 cent figure is what you feel comfortable. Again, as a consensus, we're not voting on specific fair structure. Uh, giving us some ideas, like what I hear about weekend service, some you're comfortable with eliminating the whole weekend service, or maybe we develop a threshold for weekend service, not to compare the weekday thresholds that we have 40 passenger per vehicle service, revenue service hour, and the weekend, which is not going to reach 40, you know, we are dropping everything that is under 40 on weekends, basically. So maybe, let's say for the sake of discussion, our weekend threshold should be 25 passenger per week, uh, revenue service hour. But if you give us some of those ideas, let me suggest that we will take all that in. Uh, if we, if your availability is, we'll, we'll be happy to come back, have another, like a working session with you to at least give you that feedback. Because we will use this commission as what we will be experiencing with city council, that they will be exposed to the same uh, dilemma of, no, I don't want to raise the fares to, to the dollar. At the same time, I don't want to cut deep into the service. So what's the happy medium? So I think with your input, and some of them, I think Commissioner Fart had a great idea of providing the, uh, as an alternative, saying, yes, we are cutting, let's say, Route 1 and 2. We're really going to go down and cut it more. But you have an alternative, which is routes, uh, metro routes that are complementary. And if you go to a dollar fare, it will be much closer. If we have 75 cents, you still give an option that on weekends, people are not going to be without any transit service. What we'd be concerned about is, you know, trying to piecemeal it and it may, from an operational standpoint, we still have to have the mechanics, we still have to have a dispatcher, we still have to have the service providers by our contractor at the end of the day uh, it will be too confusing which days of the week we run. On weekends, we run half the service on, on brand. On, uh, on, on central, we run this other service. It may not be a really practical, but it makes sense from a dollar standpoint, but from an operational standpoint, it may not make sense. <clears throat> so if you give us your ideas, you know, we offer that we go back to the drawing board and maybe look at the whole options of A, B, and C. Catherine, help me out. 
to see what would be the best combination that can at least achieve what your perception or what your ideas are. It will achieve our fiscal impacts in terms of what we're trying to reduce. And then maybe we can build upon that and say, okay, maybe the fare increase could be gradual. So if we did this, we'll definitely also look at our consultant to see if he may have some ideas in terms of at least giving you a level of comfort that we've accounted for the ridership decreases as a result of the higher fare increases. So give you those options. Um, what I heard from Commissioner Yakubian was the eligible operator status, what does that buy you? For the future. Yeah, I'd like to know. Yeah. Uh, how much is that? Again, it does buy us a, a better status that we can consider for additional funding in the future if we want to expand service. To be honest with you, it doesn't help us with our problem that we have today locally. But if there is an east west connector, I was mentioned, between Pasadena, Glenda, Burbank, or further to the valley, you know, can we, if we are an eligible or tier two operator, can we operate it, receive federal funding for it? That would make a better commuter connectivity. Uh, we can also look at it, Chairman uh, Welsh, about the uh, options in terms of parking revenue funds and what those are. Again, those are still decisions that council has to say, yeah, I'm comfortable by diverting parking revenue to transit. We don't know that. But certainly we can give you some ideas of what that could be. So if you want to make that recommendation to, to the city council for the study session, we can do that. Uh, also, a, a point of clarification. Uh, the format of the study session has not been totally uh, uh, confirmed, so that's something I need to get some direction how we will do that. But certainly, I would say as commissioners, you'll be more than welcome to be at the, um, uh, at the study session, provide your input. That's why I'm trying to emphasize I'd like to get as detailed of input from you so that at least we can capture it, present it to council, and individually, collectively, if the chair or any member of the commission wants to address the, concern, uh, to the council at the study session, that's all. Obviously, uh, it's a good thing for council to hear from you. So if that idea of us working working with you with your schedule before the 21st, trying to see what we can package together that captures your, your ideas, that would be maybe uh, a, a good option for your consideration. But you still want to leave here tonight with, with several thoughts and Yeah, I, I, absolutely. The more you tell us what your thinking is, the help it helps us more in package this thing in a better format. I will see if I can have another meeting with, with the Commission as a working session, give you that feedback and say, this is what we think. I think we captured your ideas. Uh, at least this was a good starting point. Maybe there's other options in between that Catherine and I with our consultant can craft to give you a little better uh, um, option so that you have some consensus, not 100 percent, that it's a better consensus rather than try to add up the dollars and say, cut this service, add that one. It adds up to $2 million, so this is the best option to go. Well, one of the things I would definitely like to recommend and see if I can get a consensus from the Commission on is, is recommending to the Council to divert as much as possible of the downtown parking revenues towards transit um, because there is a direct correlation between those things. And there's no need at this point in time to be building any additional parking or supporting more parking in downtown. That just enables more cars and makes it easier for people to drive. That's the last thing we want to be doing. So as, at least as a temporary thing, I would make that recommendation and see if people how other people. Chairman, well, um, Mr. Bogdanian, I, at what point, and as uh, Commissioner um, Sahakian so poignantly pointed out, at what point will we be able to hear from the masses? Um, thank you for bringing it up. I was one, we are going to, um, you know, we did put out notices on all the buses, rider alerts. Uh, our next step is even go further uh, in terms of, again, we kind of wanted to get a sense from the Commission of what you feel about the fare structure and whatnot. Try to make it as, po as, as uh, easy as possible to receive comments, whether they do it through our website. You know, they don't have to come here. We can put this out there on our web page. Encourage people like we have in our uh, rider alerts that go onto the B line. Look at these options, and we probably we could modify those options to make it much more simpler. At least to say, these are the fare increase options, you know, bulleted. These are the service change options, bulleted. So it's it's a lot easier than looking at high increase in uh, uh, fares or 
high reduction in, in service, uh, uh, service in the, in, on the V-Line system. Uh, doing a public uh, information piece uh, through our staff and uh, looking, working with our PIO to see if we can do actually on Channel 6 to do a, a piece on that. Again, just informative. This is what we're going through. We have a revenue loss, and these are service changes that we're considering. Please uh, let us know what you think. Uh, major organizations, uh, for example, Gundel TMA, uh, directly meet with them so that we can capture the ideas from uh, their concerns or comments from the Glendale TMA, have a meeting with the Glendale Chamber of Commerce. We did invite them. We don't have a representative here, but we can go to the chamber, the chamber board, and discuss this with them to get their input to the extent possible. One area that I think Commission didn't touch upon is the, the diet ride fare. Uh, you all discussed the beeline fare, but again, the seniors are from an economic standpoint also. You know, we may raise another $22,000. Personally, I have a concern about that, of, of trying to charge the seniors more. But again, it's dollars and cents. Wherever we can cut and add more revenue, it adds up to where we are trying to, to achieve. So that's another area, Mr. Chairman, that members of the Commission, I think we'd like to get some input from you on the senior fare. That, uh, because the dialer ride is also a component. There's about a 1,200 uh, trip reduction uh, or eliminating Sunday service. That's another area that we like to receive your input. So collectively, once we get all your inputs, we can, Catherine and I, try to capture them, give you another, maybe a package of options, focus a little bit more along the lines that you all feel more comfortable to recommend to the City Council. Well, on the dialer ride, yeah, you make a good point that, you know, saving that that uh, money and the increased fare is just not a lot of dollars, and I'd rather find those dollars other way than uh, putting it onto uh, the seniors on fixed incomes. That would be my opinion. Mr. Chair, if I may, one question. So, Jano, you're not looking at a collective... <clears throat> consensus from the Commission. Individual comments and inputs are fine with you, and you're going to, on your end, you're going to take these options, put something together, and bring them back. I think so. I, I originally started, I shared a little bit with Commissioner, uh, with Chairman Welsh, that it would be nice to have a consensus like it says, okay, 75 cent fare is good. I mean, not good, is okay. I don't like it, but it's okay overall. And then another commission may say, no, no, don't have, absolutely don't even increase it or don't cut service. So I think I have a good idea of individually or I think you're fairly consistent on what we're, what we're trying to do uh, individually, the comments that I received. So if there's further comments that you feel comfortable, we'd be happy to capture them. Uh, and then uh, based on that, I think maybe if Catherine agrees with me, if we, we should be able to package this a little bit differently so that at least uh, the dollars will match with the fare. Uh, I sense that you're not comfortable with a dollar increase fare, uh. although Commissioner Fodd has. In comparison with other agencies, we're, we're low, very, very low. But maybe with the combination of service changes and uh, looking at Saturday service, maybe we reduce it in certain segments that are not productive further. Maybe we can achieve some savings there. Look at Route 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Look at that as an option. I yeah, I mean, uh, the, the reason I'm not against the $1 increase either, but I think it should be done gradually. Hopefully, this economy is going to turn around. So, if we do, let's say, 50 cents now, and then in a year you jump up to 75 cents and then you go up to a dollar, I believe it's more reasonable and hopefully the economy will change versus just 25 cents to a dollar. That's, that, that's a big jump. Again, a dollar doesn't, doesn't look like a big figure, but for some people it is. My personal opinion, 50 cents to 75 cents, I'm fine with it to begin with and then gradually increase it from there. Uh, as far as the routes, um, I'm um, for eliminating Route 1, keep Route 2, eliminate number 12, eliminate number 13. And and what I want to make sure, take a look at What the about the changes on Route 3, the big change there, the cutting half of those trips to the to the uh, 
I'm, I'm going to come to that. Okay. I'm going to come to that. But before that, as far as the weekends, what I would like to do is specifically look at these routes and see who's using them. The last thing I want to do is if uh, to cut service to community centers where kids are playing basketball, swimming, and what have you. If that's happening, <clears throat> that should be encouraged because otherwise they're going to be hanging around street corners and, and bad things are going to come out of it. So if we can do that, I understand it's additional work. But by just looking at it, I think you should be able to get a sense and a feeling of, of what community centers you have. What's the ridership? Is it certain time of day? Is there AYSO or basketball league going on there? And, and, and I'd like to take a look at that before stating, you know, cancel Saturday and Sunday completely. Uh, and as far as Route 3... I'm going to go with option C on this one, honestly. And the reason for it is it's, it's, it's a big savings. It's, it's uh, uh, close to uh, $370,000. Yeah, I think that's, that's consistent across. Consistent. And that's consistent uh, yeah, across A, B, and C. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's a good uh, uh, suggestion as well. And um, in terms of the, the, the weekend stuff, uh, only routes... Um, one, two, and four run on Sundays, um, and uh, Route Four. Route Four actually is almost forty uh, uh, productivity on Sunday, anyway. So that right. probably wouldn't get eliminated anyway. It's actually the best route we've got. Right. Um, so on on Saturday, basically, you'd be looking at three, four, five, and six would be the ones to try to keep. Um, because they have the best numbers and tend to be circulating in some of those areas you were talking about. Correct. Chairman Welsh, if, if I might, um, with the comments, a couple key comments that I just heard um, tonight. Route 3 and Route 12 are the biggest dollar ticket items um, that there seems to be some discussion, some consensus on. If we just look at those two, and some of the other suggestions we had for cutting out some segments, some, for looking at services, just the Route 12 and the Route 3 services basically get you a 50 or 75 cent um, fare change, and because they're they're so, they're so big that they're such an impact. So it means that we don't have to necessarily eliminate weekend service, or we can strategically eliminate weekend service. Um, maybe we're not we're not cutting as deep in some of those other routes. So by picking off those two, I mean you're, you're kind of you're trading off. Do you, do you hurt a little? Fit everywhere, or do you take a couple of routes, make your biggest impact, and then really get smart about how to deploy the services within the remaining dollars you have left? I think we can come back with an option B2 or B1 or, or something that says in, in either a 50 cent or a 75 cent fare category, with those two routes being the primary service reductions, what are some of those other options we can do with either segments or times of day or days of week where consolidating we're, one, two. Right. That gets us the so we're not overcutting where we don't have to, but gets us to the bottom line where there's no net, you know, difference in those costs. Um, I, th I think we have, if there, if there is consensus on those two large cuts, um, then everything else fits in very nicely um, without a lot of impact. Because it's, even on the weekends, we still have decent 20 passenger per hour ridership, even on on Brandon Central. So. You could keep you can keep a good base of service throughout the whole city. Maybe we take Route Seven and we just run it from the west side to downtown, so we have that connectivity. Don't run it to the college. Maybe between those segment cuts, plus um, Twelve and Route Three, the work is basically done, and you have a choice between either a fifty a fifty cent or a seventy five cent fare to go with that. Well, I think even if it went to 75, it would still, we'd still, I think there's a consensus to step that. You know, 50 cents at first, then maybe 75 cents in a year or 18 months or something. So we can, if if, if I'm hearing the direction right, we have a couple of other options we can bring that that uses those two routes as the base, and then say, well, then with that, at 50 cents you get this, and at 75 cents you get this, and it kind of broadens the options yeah. with making 
what I'm what I'm hoping is the least impact to the ridership hmm. uh, for those people that really depend on that service. Yeah, because I, I am very concerned about the if we lo we're losing ridership, you know. So, Mr. Uh, Saki, you had a comment. I mean, yeah, I, I just wanted to get my um, to get my comments on the on the record for on the issue of the um, the fees or the fares. Um, I am not outright opposed to the one dollar um, fare. Um, however. Before we get to that point, we have to throw a lot of luggage out of the airplane to lighten the load. Um, I just don't want at this point to say no. I'm against it. Um, so it is on it is on the on the table for me personally. Um, I I am in agreement um, uh, with uh, Chairman uh, Welch when he was talking about the one and two. Um, that was even indicated in the initial, initial, initial line by line analysis about that one and two with the confusion and the duplication. It seems like we're trying to make a cake out of something that doesn't have the right ingredients uh, when it comes to those two uh, routes. So I would like um, that to be uh, looked at if it's uh, consolidating, as you had suggested. Um, I'm all for that. Um, I love. Number three, I think it's the star quarterback of our football team. I don't want to see too much being done to that because it um, seems to have all the right things in place. And um, I guess the 12, um, yeah, I'm ready to go, I think. Um. And, and I'm curious, you didn't, you didn't bring out 12. You discussed one and three, but you didn't mention 12. Why is that? Despite hearing at least three, four of us saying maybe twelve should be eliminated. No, oh, I think she did. Yeah, she. she oh, you, she, you did. She said yes. that, that was one of the twelve. Two I'm sorry. Then I must have missed her. Okay. 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 My bad. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Weissman. Yeah. Um, because, as has been discussed, I'm, I would certainly be willing to support uh, the the big ticket items here, which would be the. Uh, the, the cancellation of 12 and the uh, the modification to line three, a, a little bit selfish. I'm a line three user, but usually it's only one-way trips from home downtown, and it would actually be the other direction that would be impacted, except for having to wait longer. Uh, just as a logistical matter, let's say you were going to implement that the half the buses don't go north on line three. How would you do that? Would you change the, the numbering, or what exactly would be involved with it? Uh, yes, we actually would change the numbering on Route 3, um, so that the Route 3 um, is the full line from downtown to JPL. Uh, we've actually started this process because of our route change with La Cañada. You will now see a 33 and a 34. Um, so it will be Route 3, the long haul during the week. 31 would be Saturday from downtown to Montrose only. Um, uh, 32 would be the route that would go from downtown just to the college. So you would have a head sign that would say that. It would say college only. Uh, and then um, the Loch Nyata service, we, they actually um, diverted their routes. So their 33 route runs between Montrose and JPL, which is similar to what they're doing now. But their afternoon service is going to run between Montrose and Loch Nyata High School. So one turns left, one turns right at the end of the route. The only way to tell the students which bus is which uh, is to renumber the buses. So we started that process to start to reprogram the head signs. And then the new schedule that you will see come out this next week uh, will have all the route numbers on the schedule for which bus and which time. So you can, you'll know, where, depending on where you're boarding the bus, which bus to look for and, and what that destination is going to be. That's kind of my concern with that, and, and my willingness to support these items sort of comes with a caveat, which is that I really want us to uh, do a good job of outreach to the people that are going to be affected by the uh, any of the service reductions or the route cancellations or anything like that. I, I know it's hard to do but from what the gentleman said coming in. I have seen the, the flyers up there in the racks on the number three buses. And I don't, the last couple times I've took the bus, I don't recall seeing anyone actually take one and look at it. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure, you know, short of hitting people upside the head with a two by four, what you can do to get them to, you know, participate in something that's going to affect them profoundly. But, yeah. But. You have I, what you need. I to think, think? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, members of the commission. I think you gave us a lot of thoughtful uh, 
comments on the what we were expecting in terms of uh, this, this is a very complicated issue. I mean, never fair cr increases service cuts are never a, a good thing. That's what we've never done it for 17 years. <laughs> but at some point, you, you reach a point where we have to deal with it. So I think we've taken good notes. Uh, my suggestion to the Commission would be, I uh, was just looking at the calendar. We have the September Commission meeting, which is on the 27th of September. Uh, the study session with Council is on the 21st. For us to be able to package uh, some of these ideas together, at minimum we, we like to have about two weeks to also be able to consult with our consultant, Dan Boyle. So if Commission will be willing, if we can make, instead of the um, just a suggestion, having the, the 27th meeting, we have an early Commission meeting in September, uh, to discuss this this item, it will take a commission meeting. I mean, it, I'm sure we, we will spend a good hour or two rehashing this thing so that it gives us the opportunity to then package everything, have it ready for the 21st, because usually we need three weeks to have items to city council. It, it's a very tight, but, you know, the week of the 6th of September, holidays, Monday is the Labor Day weekend, and that week, uh, we can check calendars. We can look at the room availability to be able to have one more session with the commission, kind of present you with uh, with these ideas, and then uh, get your consensus again, and then take it to council. Before we have the study session, or before the study session? session, because I had a, I hate to package this together and then just take it to the. To the oh, city so you, council. You're, you're asking for a special meeting? It's special. Of, instead of, of having our, sometime in the right, er, right. early part of yeah, instead of having the technically one option is instead of having the um, uh, the count regular meeting on the 27th of September, you can have a special meeting instead in that week of the sixth. That's my suggestion. If your calendars work, uh, if we have a room available, if that doesn't work, we can try to do it the week after, but it, it is make it very tight because then we have to package everything for the city council study session. Um, and I would suggest either the eight or the nine. It's a Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, we'll find the room. I'm sure we'll, we'll we'll try to find the room tomorrow and immediately email to you. So instead of having a regular meeting, have a special meeting. Uh, I think it's a very important issue, and I think your comments are very valuable, so that council at least knows. That would be a regularly noticed meeting with public input. And yeah, we will. We will okay. do that again. It okay. gives us a little time. As uh, soon as tomorrow, if I find out if that works for the commission, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, you know notice it uh, ahead of time, and then make sure everybody knows. Meantime, again, we try to do our best to talk to the interested parties, Glendale TMA, for example, the yeah. chamber. And that was my concern because we heard that there are some options that may be unacceptable to the TMA, right. and I'd really like to hear what they are first before I, we start debating. At least. Know. Even if I don't have, I mean, we will make sure that they've had enough time to come to the commission on that date and give you their feedback, so at least you have their input. But at the same time, we'll try to approach them and hear what they have to say so that while we're packaging uh, this option, whatever that might be, uh, give you their input as well as along with that. So if, if those dates look okay to you, um, both of those two dates, I will work on having a special meeting on that day, um, September. That, that's the concern. You're okay. Um, yeah, I think so. I'm not sure that we should cancel the September regular meeting, though. I think if that's we, fine. I mean, we can, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. We we. Okay. And it's just our staff. We we're trying to. Allocate our, our staff. <laughs> no, we're just trying to allocate our resources to, to focus on um, what we have at hand. So, Well, yeah, I, we understand this is a matter of some urgency. So we're okay. certainly, I think we're, sounds like everybody is pretty much available for. Okay. So we will email you the, soon, the, so. the specific time and date and, uh, and the room, depending on what's available. 
and then package your ideas into what we think it'd be, be a, it's a moderate, fair increase, service cuts with the Route 12 and changes to Route 3 being the, the focus, the key major cut or change, and then a combination of the other ones, whether it's a weekend service or Route 1, 2 combinations. Okay. Like if we can, you know, squeeze it in somehow that we don't need to consider the uh, service reduction for dial a ride, you know, right? That would be good then. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I think I I received that in terms of fare increase or service reduction. Okay, so I think we're ready to move on then. Next item on the agenda, please. Item six: Commission staff comments updates. Mr. Chairman, if I may uh, go first. A um, couple of quick updates. Uh, uh, one, uh, you may have um, watched the council meeting that has related to the GNS uh, appeal that the city council considered uh, at the public hearing, uh, the GNS uh, yeah. appeal, <laughs> and the council um, uh, overturned the Transportation Parking Commission in terms of limiting the uh, owner's permit to three years and uh, gave uh, GNS the five year. Uh, prior to that, however, council had made a motion to uh, approve the motion as was recommended by the commission to basically look at a whole uh, vehicle for hire process, looking at the our current ordinance, looking at the issues that we're faced with with the taxi cap, you know, cap of 83, uh, how we issue the permits, uh, that they're, whether they're staggered, the uh, owner permits uh, are expired on an annual basis or on a staggered basis, all of those things that we are, staff is looking into doing some research and we'll come back to the commission uh, very soon to give you some ideas of how we can approach that analysis, whether we do it in-house or we retain uh, the service of a consultant to look at independent study of our taxi ordinance and see how that would work for us. Uh, that's that's an option that I, I'm doing some research on. It'll be back to the commission for consideration. That's that's number one. Number two is uh, bicycle master plan. Uh, we are uh, we have started the the study in terms of we're doing the more of the engineering work with our consultant, and uh, as part of that, we will be going to council to approve a larger uh, contract with our uh, Ryan Steiner, who is our consultant for the Bicycle Master Plan. However, we've started the process. We're looking at uh, our current uh, Bicycle Master Plan and how we can expand it. Uh, we are going to have a Bicycle Master Plan Advisory Committee, uh, as you, you, we've mentioned to, to the Commission. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, two Commission members are uh, participating in the Bicycle Master Plan. So just so that I raise that question of who the two commissioners are interested. I, talk about I, I, yeah, I think, uh, I just want to confirm uh, so that we will be setting up a schedule. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Commissioner Fahd and Commissioner Weissman uh, are the members of the Bicycle Master Plan so that we can um, notify you. Uh, we will be calling a meeting soon with all the interested parties that are part of that co uh, master plan committee. And they can attend the meeting only on bicycles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so number three is there's a uh, international walk to school day, uh, October 6th. And um, as our, through our efforts working with the school, uh, Glenwood Glen Unified School District, uh, we have uh, a lot more interest this year than we had uh, the previous year. So a number of schools, uh, through the volunteers, will be participating on October 6th on a, what's the, we, that is the International Walk to School Day, that large group of parents and the kids will be festivities and they will be walking. Or biking. Or, or biking <laughs> to school. Uh, we will let you know uh, in terms of the day, but for now, uh, it will be early in the morning. Early means just the first thing in the morning at the school, start of the school hours, somewhere between 8 to 9, or 9 a.m. And uh, we are working with the volunteers that are uh, basically working on that. And I have um, uh, Miss uh, Kara Sergal, that is parent organizer from uh, R.D. White. She's been very, very active 
uh, on that. And so Muir, uh, Keppel, R.D. White, uh, Jefferson, Marshall, Verdugo Woodland Hills, uh, Verdugo Woodland, and Dunsmore School have already signed up to be part of this. So each one of those schools, they will have uh, uh, activities, and we hope that that would really trigger more interest in terms of the kids and the parents to sort of driving to school, walk to school, and or ride their bike to school. So that is the date. If any one of the commissioners are interested to be part of those festivities, we'll certainly let you know ahead of time. Um, also, uh, last Tuesday, City Council voted to suspend uh, any professional parking uh, in the South Brand District. That is to just put a moratorium technically on it. There was some discussion at the council, at the commission before when we were dealing with uh, Maple, uh, preferential parking as far as whether we can do it administratively or not. But there is a South Branch specific plan, land use, that is currently being developed by the planning department. Council direction to staff was to have a moratorium so there is no preferential parking in South Brand area until we do the South Brand parking study, which is currently underway, and we have completed the parking occupancy survey that was done. Again, Nelson Nygaard, our mobility consultant, is working on that. Staff is reviewing that, and then uh, very soon we'll be bringing back to the commission uh, and the uh, planning commission as well, because it has to do with land uses, parking requirements, and what the current parking status is in that area, and how can we mitigate that whether it's on the residential side or on the auto dealers that are, you know, either they have off-street parking, they're not using it, or they're parking on residential street and what the key areas are where we need to make some improvement. So that, that is uh, a council action that took place last Tuesday. Question for you. Yes. So that's no new uh, districts down there. Exactly. It does, that won't affect the, the Windsor one that we approved. Uh, it's already in place. Okay. That is already in place. We've issued permits, and, uh, and the residents have their permits and their parking. What if one of the adjoining streets to Windsor wants to, to add on to that? That would be technically under this moratorium. That would, okay. Right. I will still will have to check. But... Based on my knowledge, since that's what something, the first thing I, I thought of technically by the municipal code, we can expand it without coming to the commission because which is within the same area as long as we have a petition, but that would be subject to that moratorium. We haven't heard and we haven't received anything official yet in terms of a petition, but there, we are aware that in the area one or two streets are concerned about the shift of some of that parking that is occurring. Uh, last thing, I gave you an invitation. Uh, this is for the dedication ceremony for the opening of the Fairmont Avenue Bridge, which it's almost complete. We're putting the finish it, finishing touches on the bridge. It is on uh, September 8th, and all of you are invited. So there will be some uh, uh, many de dignitaries or, uh, from Caltrans, from State of California, and from Metro, and uh, public officials from City of Glenda will be there. And so we'd like to invite you to participate in, uh, in that dedication ceremony. Uh, um, a card was left on your desk, I mean, on your table uh, for that purpose. So that basically concludes my staff comments. Uh, one more thing related to the South Brand. Um, Mr. Hagani uh, talked to me at that council meeting last week and was asking about the commission. Had we picked two commissioners to serve on uh, the Thank committee? you for bringing that up. Uh, I would like to confirm uh, who the two commissioners will be because we do have, we've had many of these discussions and I just want to confirm it so that I can put them on a list and I will send it to each one of the commissions that on the subcommittees or committees that we have who is participating. Uh, on those committees, so um, I I like to confirm that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, were were you, Bill, on that? I'm trying to remember. I believe Commissioner Weissman, I remember, and I think uh, Mr. Chairman yourself Thanks were so interested yeah. in that. Well, yeah, because we were both in yeah. the, the earlier the study. Place. Yes. Okay. So, okay. But if anybody else wants, to please. With my workload, uh, I'm okay. lucky to be here. Okay. Um, that sure. It? That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner comments? I had a, a question for, uh, for you, Mr. Bogdania. The, the meeting for the high-speed rail, uh, I guess the information that was forwarded on to us, uh, is this Wednesday? Is that correct? In Burbank? Uh, you can check. Well, the email had the wrong date. It said the 26th. Right. 
which was, I believe, it should be the 25th. Valley. Yes, that's Antelope Valley. There are three workshops uh, on that in different geographies. The one that Burbank? is closest to us yeah. is in Burbank, and so I believe that is Wednesday. on. It's Wednesday, yes. It's on Wednesday, August 25th. Burbank Library, uh, I can send a confirmation to all of you if you're interested to attend. Okay. Any other comments uh, by commissioners? Mr. Weissman, yes. I uh, wanted to mention something that I've noticed as sort of an ongoing problem for the last several years, and I'm sure this is something of uh, which your department is already uh, fully aware. But uh, there's a kind of uh, a continual gridlock problem that I've been observing at the intersection of Broadway and Brand, pretty much right in the heart of downtown Glendale. And the gridlock is mostly for the eastbound traffic on Broadway. And typically what happens in that intersection is that uh, because of the fact that it's a short block between Brand and Maryland, and because of the fact that there's a very active uh, metro bus stop there on Broadway, that the segment of block between Maryland and Brown sometimes completely fills up with vehicles. And so you end up having gridlock vehicles stuck out in the middle of the intersection that are unable to, to go eastbound on Broadway. Um, I notice in a lot of the other intersections downtown, there are there is signage saying, do not block intersection. And I, really, I don't have any illusions that how well a sign can do at stopping people from actually gridlocking. But I noticed that there's no uh, signage like that at Broadway and Brand, which is probably the intersection downtown that needs it the most. And I don't know if there's been any consideration given to possible engineering countermeasures that might help uh, alleviate the gridlock. One of them might be changing the timing of the traffic light at Broadway and Maryland. Or I, I don't know if there's anything else that might be done with additional signage or any other type of countermeasures. But uh, when traffic is fairly heavy downtown, that intersection gridlocks on a regular basis. And uh, what I, personally, what I'd love to see would be gridlock cameras or something that would, you know, take pictures of the cars stranded out there in the middle so they could be sighted and fined. But uh, I don't think that's probably possible in the near future. But just wanted to mention that and see if part of the problem comments. there is people trying to turn left onto Maryland too, yeah. blocking the street because there's no left turn lane there. Yeah, that's, so. and there's no right turn lane on the brand, so everybody yeah. stops through the pedestrians. Yeah. We really so, effectively have one. Through you know, lane. any any kind of those things that might be you know Sergeant, that might help. The <laughs> timing of the signal again, but as you mentioned, those are you know proximity of Maryland intersection, Maryland Broadway, Brand and Broadway, and the heavy pedestrians that are crossing uh, uh, Brand, it just stops that right turners and it creates... And I'm problem. kind of concerned because the last time I was out there I, I saw the intersection gridlock and I saw, you know, pedestrians basically have to walk in between the cars to get across the street and one pedestrian I observed was a woman pushing a baby carriage talking on a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, this is just an accident waiting to happen. So, Excellent. Wasn't this the intersection that you were considering criss-cross operation for pet mm -hmm. crossing? No, that was uh, council had looked, asked us to look at the Harvard and yeah. brand because of the Americana entrance and uh, to have a diagonal crossing and um, yeah, that, that creates a lot more delays but again, it's one of those do you want to have a busier downtown and have more pedestrian friendly. So those are things we're looking at, possibly maybe looking at a crossing on the north side of Harwood because there is not a crossing there. That's an option. Okay. Anything else? Okay, next item, please. Item seven is adjournment. Uh, to move, we adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All right, we are adjourned.